Hello, everyone. Please let us know real quick if you can see and hear us. We would super duper appreciate it because I just know the way this works is if I take it for granted and assume it's going to work, then it just won't. Quite. Uh, I'm particularly <laughs> looking forward to this stream because this is the stream about my cat. Now, that might make you go, what? You say what now? <laughs> Well, my cat's name, um, contrary to most people who think of him simply as Shadow, is actually Vladimir. Um, he is a pedigree cat, a Vladimir differing something or another. Um, and we got ourselves a second cat not long after, um, whom we called Isabella, for, I think, obvious reasons. For those of you who know your Vladimir and Isabella lores, um, Vladimir's wife in good old Warhammer being Isabella. So, yeah, Bella our cat and Vlad our cat. That's what we're going to be discussing today, perhaps with a little bit less cat references. I don't know. I think people are going to be kind of cats are one of those things that they might be legitimately more interested. In. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, listen, he's not in here today, so I can't pull him over and go, look, it's Vlad. I'm um, just assume I have a large cat in my hands. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. So uh, I think we are live everywhere. So y'all just let me know if everything's good. Cause there's a little bit of a delay there, but I think it's all good now, but uh, yes. Job. Welcome. Hello. Hi. Uh, okay. Yeah. So it did. All right. So I'm pretty sure on Twitch it started fine, but on YouTube it literally started in the middle of your cat story. So on YouTube, everyone's going. On YouTube, everyone's going. What? <laughs> so just just for the YouTubers out there, because you may have missed that small detail, I have a cat by the name of Vladimir, and when we got a second cat, my second cat's name was Isabella, because Vladimir and Isabella, as you will learn as we progress onwards with our lovely stream. And as we also consider the good old character that is Vlad von Karstein, I would just like to say that this is probably one of my favorite characters in Warhammer. Now, I will probably say that about most characters in Warhammer at some point or another, because, hey, I love me Warhammer, I do. But in particular, Vladimir was one that captured my interest back when I was pretty young when the very first undead army list came out and i liked it and as vladimir became expanded i liked much of it but not all of it so this is going to be one of those streams where i come in and say you know it could have been done differently it could have been done like for example this and because i was so let's say passionate about this particular subject i even brought it up with the actual authors of the individual stories and said hey your story says this couldn't it have said this to which they went yeah that would probably have been a better outcome <laughs> wouldn't it damn it shame we didn't really write that in isn't it i was like yes but it can still be implied so as far as i'm concerned it's right and i stomped off with a big happy smile on my face so we'll be looking forward to that later on in the stream yeah, so uh, as you may have guessed from the name of the stream or Andy's little speech or the vote or any other myriad of hints, uh, <laughs> today we're going to be talking about good old Vlad von Karstein, the vampire count, mm. the original, the OG, because a lot of people get confused over the technicalities of the term vampire count because it really shouldn't be the name of the faction, to be honest, but it is, so <laughs> we have to work with it uh, because he's... The only one of the uh, seven original bloodlines that is technically a count. The rest of them would be disqualified because they don't have the legal authority. Um, Pretty much. Which is actually really <laughs> funny to think about. <laughs> you stuck yeah, them all in a room. <laughs> we've discussed this behind the scenes more than once as to the whole nature of the vampire count army list name. And you're left with a, yeah, it makes no sense. It's a stupid name. Sounds because, cool, though. <laughs> yeah, but it sounds cool. Um, and hey, we like it. So, as always, we're going to be uh, taking any Super Chats that come in in batches. So, if you've got a Super Chat that comes in, don't worry. We will answer it as we progress. But we're going to make sure that we get through our various sections of good old Vlad von Karstein's lore. Because there are some particularly interesting sections here. Some of which I am going to call out for what I see as potential bullshit. Yeah, and this is... Oh boy, this is one of those characters who a lot of people really like him, including different writers. So a mm -hmm. lot of writers have taken cracks at him, which means that there's some very different versions of the character, depending on which edition you're looking at, particularly when it comes to Black Library novels, which we'll be oh, yeah. tackling those. Uh, 
So before we get into it, uh, we're just going to take care of kind of the early super chats and stuff that came in, and then we're going to hop into uh, Big Vladdy Daddy and figure out Vladdy what's Daddy. going on with this story. Yeah, that's his. <laughs> that's his total total war. Oh, <laughs> Vladdy <laughs> Daddy, bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> so we got Hammond. Why was Sace afraid of Siete? Because Siete Ocho Nueve. Oh, God, what? he's going into other languages now. <laughs> Six, eight, nine. Leave Spanish alone, Hammond. You already torture English enough. <laughs> uh, Peanut Monster. Andy, I know a big question. How... <laughs> okay, Andy, what's your simple version for how do you. Holy crap. I mean, let's just start deep. Um. <clears throat> Well, I can't think of a pithy way to answer this one. So um, the peanut monster, uh, I would suggest possibly we can have a discussion about that maybe on a separate stream at some point, because character arcs are big, deep and relatively meaningful in terms of how you're best to express them. I'm going to presume in role play games, which is what you're looking at here. So I will just simply say that um, ensuring that there are character arcs for not just the PCs, but the NPCs two um mm -hmm. and uh don't worry too much about the cliches um let the stories breathe through the course of play and even the most cliched one will through play and the interruption of other pcs and npcs on them slowly but surely turn into their own thing that are quite separate from perhaps your cliched origins so don't worry too much the the whole point of role playing is to have a bit of fun and sometimes that means starting off with cliches and that's cool Hobby Squire, hey guys, caught up in whoop, excuse me, <laughs> caught up in work right now. Can't wait to listen to this later. Mm -hmm. Vald is my favorite. My He's favorite also my favorite. Good old Vald. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, won my first game of two thousand point Warhammer: The Old World yesterday well against the Empire. Need to figure out a name for my higher event because the cannonballs just bounced off of them. Nice. See, I was, I was telling y'all the Malachite stream. The higher fans, they're fine. They're fine. <laughs> <laughs> also, <laughs> unlike Vlad, who it's fair to say was somewhat famously killed by a cannonball at one point. It's all right. He got better. Uh, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Swartz, uh, thanks so much for the YouTube membership, by the way. Really appreciate it. Uh, Jack Blanken, Vlad is dad. Also, you guys are the freaking best. Thanks for all the entertainment. Thank you. Well, oh, we really appreciate thanks, that. Jack. I appreciate it. Um, Tarmacon must rise. Bring back. We appreciate the weekly, the weekly Tarmacon <laughs> reminder. <laughs> soon, soon. Also, I just want to highlight this because it made me laugh. Lore bear. <laughs> <laughs> um, the laughing god. Hey, gents, excited for the stream, but alas, I am working. I will say, no! I, was not, I was not a fan of Vlad's rotting, no nose corpse look. Even at his most vampy, I figured he looked more animalistic. We'll talk about different depictions of his appearance. Yeah. That's actually something interesting based on, we talked about different writers' attempts at Vlad's. There's also yep. been a lot of different artists' attempts at Vlad's. Fair. Um, his very first appearance is very different to his later appearances. And then, Hammond, how would both of you go about a Sotek Hammer and Lawhammer version of an undead Chaos Champion, essentially reverse Krell? There are technically already exists a couple. Um, like Valnir the Reaper is a really famous one. Um, come the end times, there's a relatively famous one too. Although I really didn't like that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am, I am not a fan of uh, like actual undead characters starting to chaos. I think that's super stupid yeah, because there's some. It just sort of breaks up parts of the lore that don't parse very well. And when you combine them, you really need to combine them well to make a good story. Or it just feels a little bit like you don't really understand how the lore works and how these characters work, do you? Yeah, but I think I think more violation of nature type characters like Valnir the Reaper is a really good print for how usually chaos will try to address like undead type things without doing true undead, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Call Franz versus Vlad. <laughs> Wild. It would not, it would, yeah, it would not go well for Franz. I'm gonna be honest. That, yeah, no. Even even with Galmaraz, that ring is a bitch. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, all right, so. That's all out of the way. Let's actually get started here. Let's uh, dive also, in. The last little thing I'll say before we get started started is that for those of you that enjoyed the podcast version, I'm all caught up. Um, so all of the podcasts are fully caught up. Um, they're set to release on a daily schedule now at noon every day. So in the event that you're like, but what about this episode? It's coming. It's just not to its scheduled day yet. But I am officially caught up. <laughs> um, thank God. All right. So with that out of the way. Let's talk Vlad, by which I mean, haha, no, we're not talking about Vlad at all at the start. We're talking about somebody else. 
which is yeah, uh, indeed. It's one of the biggest mysteries of the character, actually, because um, to this day, including the eighth edition of the army list, his true nature is just simply not stated out in black and white. But it's very, very clear exactly who Vlad was before he was Vlad and what he was doing long back in the mists of histories, because Vlad von Karstein's story starts several thousand years before the rise of the von Karsteins, approximately 2000 IC. So that's 2000 years after the coronation of Sigmar, assuming we go with the standard timeline and not the old world. Less said about the better. Um, but several thousand years earlier, the curse of vampirism started. And I think I will then pass back. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about good old Nehekara uh, in various yeah. streams because we've talked about Setra quite a bit. We've talked mm -hmm. about Nagash quite a bit. Gosh. And we have one character who gets caught up in the legacy of these other characters, which is good old Vashanesh. Now, like Andy said, one of the things that's super interesting about B Vashanesh is there's kind of like a, oh, uh, what do you call it? A, um, that the... I don't know. Uh, what are you trying? Like a, a bit of a sliding scale where if you have like the earliest editions and the last editions of Warhammer Fantasy, uh, in the middle, you have a lot of the editions are almost very frank about kind of saying who Vashanesh is. Um, whereas if you're looking at like eighth edition or earlier editions, it's a lot more mysterious yeah. to the point that the later editions are super like they it, it can be genuinely difficult to realize it and then if you're reading like the warhammer fantasy roleplay second edition book it just kind of flat out says it and you're yeah. like oh okay <laughs> but uh vashanesh is most versions of the story uh i think every version i've read so i'm pretty sure this is consistent is that he is born in kimri mm -hmm. uh and vashanesh is uh quite a legacy bloodline wise because he is a direct descendant of the royalties of Kemri, which means that his bloodline ties all the way back to Nagash, and it ties <laughs> probably all the way back to Setra. Uh, he's got quite a few very, very powerful relatives. Uh, and in Warhammer, bloodlines can be pretty important, especially in a nation like that. But he rises up in Kemri, and what happens from here gets a little bit muddy, because we don't know a lot about his early life. Um, we know that although he was some kind of prince or relatively royal figure, we don't have a lot of specifics about like his parents or what his early life was like, other than we can kind of assume he received a typical Kimrian uh, raising where he learned how to fight, he learned tactics, he learned uh, the the nature of you know the, the gods, he learned the nature of power, which a lot of uh, Kimrians in particular have a deep obsession with power. Um, but what's interesting about Vlad in particular, or Vashanesh, is that he does something really weird, which is that when he's born, there is a lot going on that Nagash has already fallen. Uh, he's already been defeated. He's been kicked out of Nehekara. Many believe that he's dead. Uh, of course, he's not, but they believe that he is. Uh, yes. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Lindsay. Yep, we got that little lore tidbit. Um, and uh, oh, what's going on at this time contemporary-wise is that there are things happening in Lamia. Um, there are rumors coming out in the rest of Nehekara that the nobles of Lamia are doing dark and terrible things at night or that there are monsters lurking within the city, but it's still at kind of that rumor era where nobody's 100% sure what's going on. And Vashanesh is eventually drawn to these rumors. Now, exactly why isn't 100% clear in various stories, whether it's he maybe thought there was a form of power to be found here, so he goes there, or he hears stories about Neferata in particular, and his curiosity leads him on a journey. Um, there is a couple of notes here or there that at least give it um, some motivation. Um, one of which is that he is almost certainly already by this point a noted general, someone who has got a tactical mind, someone who is perhaps an actual genius at these things. Um, the actual reason for why he goes to Lamia, as in Vashanesh, and I do think it is worth making clear, it's possible Vashanesh isn't Vlad. 
it is worth making clear, even though it is stated in some books, it is, it is then yeah. rewritten and restated and reframed in different ways in other books. But we're definitely taking the line that it's worth covering Vashanesh because the chances that it's not Vashanesh are diminishingly small. Um, so he is someone who is clearly of incredible intellect and not just that, he has a presence. A presence that even when he's mortal, when he arrives in the court of Lamia, not just attracts the queen, she looks at him and goes, well, holy crap, look at him. Yeah, this is a man, just a, like, granted, he's a noble of Kimri, so, you know, this is, he's kind of the creme de la creme when it comes to humans in many cases, that he, who has spent his life battling greenskins, beastmen, uh, maybe threats from the sea, all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. And when he arrives in the court of Lamia, there's a couple of cool stories about this in that you have to think that you have a, what is essentially a, a insect walking into a room of apex predators who have developed a very nasty city where they know they're apex predators and they're cutting loose a little too often, which means that they are indulging in their desires and urges to a very violent extent, which is what will doom Lamia in the long run. But yeah. Vlad walk or Vashnesh walks into this room completely <laughs> confident with an air of almost superiority and confidence and knowing that he is, he has the situation under control, which is wild to think about. Cause if they decided to kill him, he would just die. Like there was, he's literally in the room with Abarash, Neferata, Zorin, Ushorin, yep. Harakte, like the now, original founders are sitting in this throne room. You might not know who these people are. So let's just have a quick sidebar That's while we idea. go. These are freaking enormously powerful, if you wish to use the term master vampires, the sources of the, all the bloodlines that we will come to know are gathered in this court. This is not a minor court of nobodies. This is a court full of the very first arguably true immortals um, that have come from the human side in the world. And they are not your tiny little life priests who sit there going, I've achieved immortality. I will live for... No, these things are enormously strong, enormously powerful. You might argue that the elixir of life that has been discovered by the good old queen herself and put into place by the good old queen herself is better than the alternatives that have come before. Now, it's also worth noting, we won't be covering this with any great depth because I'm sure we'll do a Neferata stream at some point and then uh -huh. we can dive in to all the details of the elixir that they create. Um, but these are full-blown vampires and Vasanesh walks into that place like he owns the place and quite bluntly captures the heart of the queen in a way that is not really very deeply discussed in most of the sources other than she falls in love with him. And the reason I say that it's not discussed is because they never take state clearly whether he falls in love with her or not. Um, although it seems to be the case that he probably did. And this is, I think, really important for the vampire lore that we're going to be heading into when we move over towards Vlad's story. But for the moment, at least, we have got ourselves one of the most capable and arguably powerful of the good old Kemrians have arrived over in the court of Lamia. They've captured the heart of the queen. Indeed, she is so taken by him that she's about to do something that I'm quite sure she probably wouldn't have done if he just wasn't so bloody marvelous. Yeah, and to put one thing I want to add uh, when it comes to the scene of him walking in, um, although there are many parts of the book that I'm kind of eh about, uh, one of the parts that I really do enjoy about Josh Reynolds' version of the Neferata story is we get her point of view on Vashnesh's arrival. And when he walks into the room, the vampires don't, they have different responses. Like Ushorin uh, considers outright attacking him and basically just leaps at him and ready to just rip him apart. And Vlad, Vashnesh just doesn't flinch at all he's just ready for it and if he has to fight ushorin he will before ushorin gets called off by the other vampires he aberash does not like him because aberash can tell immediately that neferata is stricken with him and aberash is kind of the classic chivalrous story where he loves neferata but and she kind of loves him but due to the difference in their station 
it'll never that love will never be consummated. It's like if you're looking at like the old classic chivalry stories where the love is never realized. Instead, it's just kind of this tragic motivation. That's the Aberash situation with Neferata. So he's very jealous of Vashnesh immediately. And Vashnesh just doesn't care. And he literally talks shit to everyone. And with Zorin, who at this point has been doing a pretty good job of trying to kind of manipulate Neferata and be, you know, the little advisor in her ear, being her most reliable person and really trying to control her. Vashnesh cuts through the shit immediately. You know, this yeah. Grima worm tongue like figure is trying to talk to Neferata. And Vashnesh basically says, Hey, like, I'm over here. I'm she's talking to me. You shut up. And Wazorin's like, What? And Neferata goes, No, yeah, no, he's right. Shut up. <laughs> Which hilariously, Vashnesh's arrival, if you're following that version of the story, is a pretty critical point to Wazorin losing control. Which leads to him going to Nagash and trying to rely on Nagash, which causes all sorts of problems. And um, Neferata actually kicks everybody else out of the room because she wants to have a one on one discussion with Vashinesh, which they do. Unfortunately, discussion. yeah, discussion. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, we don't really get the details of said discussion, uh, as spicy as they may have been. But after a conversation where Vashnesh is not only able to demonstrate his charm, his charisma, and his intellect, Neferata is so taken with him. And of course, he's royalty from Kimri, does not hurt uh, mm -hmm. for her seeking to expand her power. You know, Neferata's not stupid. There are advantages in this for her. She decides to marry him. And not only does she marry him, but if she's going to have a husband, he needs to be of the appropriate power. So she gives him, and he is the last to receive the elixir of life, uh, immortal life. Yeah, and I think it's worth making sure that this is as clear as it possibly can be. She uses the last of her original elixir of immortality that she had created to make Vasanesh. This is no simple blood kiss as we will come to know it from the various other la 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 lower layers of vampires. Um, he is a first creation. Um, he is effectively equivalent to her and all the other firsts. And she mm -hmm. is um, taking him on as an equal. And that says a lot about his character. She is already old by this point. She is already pretty much stuck in her ways and seen a variety of different folks pass through her court. This is someone who completely stunned her, who completely floored her. She was like, this is worth it. And there is no doubt in my mind that it must have been reciprocated or she simply would not have stepped forward on this. Now, you might, particularly if you're a great Vlad and Isabella fan, such as I am, immediately go, oh, bullshit, um, because <laughs> you'll be looking for Vlad and Isabella but to be the great love. I am going to make an argument that that is still the case, and I will get onto that a little bit later. But for the moment, we just need to just accept it for what it is. Vashinesh has been turned into one of the very first vampires. He was already enormously competent as a mortal. Whether the various tales of whether he was a general or whether he was just a noble or whatever, none of those really matter because we have the proof in the pudding with Neferata's very visceral reaction to him. He is as close to perfect as she has seen to the point that she immediately organizes for the marriage. This is not a small thing. This is not some simple little, oh, let's do this thing. And this is not some woman who easily gets weak at the knees. This is freaking Neferata. And she sees Vashinesh and she goes, yep, that'll do. Perfect. Love it. I'm into that one. Yep. So what happens from this point is that Vashinesh, of course, joins the Court of Vampires as functionally the King of Lamia, though he kind of remains a little more to Neferata's side as opposed to like, He's, he does not do the classic thing where a king steps in and is like, all right, well, I'm the man. I'm in charge now. Like, Neferata yeah. maintains her control, which Vashinesh respects. He knows what he's playing at. And I, I'm going to immediately drop in a point here because note this. Note this immediately because we get our first steps towards Vashinesh's character and possibly who Vlad becomes later. Note, he is a man who has fallen in love, almost certainly, has mm -hmm. looked to someone beside him with respect, 
and doesn't try to lord it over him, isn't someone who is filled with absolute ambition, isn't someone who is notoriously wild and mad and she has to somehow control. Quite the opposite. He is noble, he is proud, he is certain, and he makes a king. And as, he, as a king, he respects his queen, doesn't just respect her, shares power with her. And that is a fascinating difference for what many of the stories we'll be discussing on the later generations will lay at the feet for the vampires. And I think there is behind the scenes quite a lot of justification for why this is the case. Yes. Now, what happens to Vashness at this point is a bit mysterious because he remains very much in the background because this we're still at the point where this is Neferata's story, not Vashness's. Mm -hmm. um, there are some authors who have tried to kind of address this where they keep Neferata's story the same but they go, okay, Vashonash is pretty important. What do I do with him where he's not a super important <laughs> character? And some authors have said, oh, okay, at this point, he ends up being the uh he ends up being an envoy to Grand Cathay. So he sets off across the sea and he goes to spend a, uh, quite a few years over in Grand Cathay as Lamia is going through various crises that lead up to Nagash making a relationship with Wazorin. And then all of the princes discover what's going on in Lamia, and that whole shit goes down where you have the 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 all the princes get together, and good old Alcazar the Conqueror rises up and smashes Lamia. And of course, it's like, okay, well, where the hell is Vashinish in all of this? And most stories seem to indicate that he's gone, that he that Neferata sent him somewhere where he needed to be for a very important reason whether that was Grand Cathay or he's off fighting some kind of mutual foe, like he's dealing with a Beastman invasion or Greenskins. Maybe he's an envoy to the Elves or the Dwarves, um, but he's somewhere important. And this really starts to establish um, that Vashnesh and uh, Vlad, as we will note later, he is a world walker. He is someone yep. who explores. He almost has kind of almost a sense of wanderlust because as we'll learn about his character later, this man craves knowledge like nobody's business. Mm -hmm. And not and not in the sense that Wazorin does, where he's like greedily just trying to learn magical lore to make himself more powerful. Vashinesh seems to have a genuine interest in studying humans, going to different cultures, experiencing their culture, living among them for long periods of time, and learning about humanity from humanity, which we'll talk more about later after a couple of events, which yeah, is a indeed. really unique dynamic, especially when you consider that he's a vampire. I'll go as far to say that it's very likely that Neferata um, was reined in her extremes, and many of the choices of her court were reined in <laughs> by the influence of Vashanesh, because Vashanesh is, as it turns out, a really good king. He is really good at his job. That much seems to be the case. And the fact that he ends up wandering seems to be, I think, an indicator of two clear things. Number one, his character and the things that he is willing to do to better understand. And number two, the fact that he was reining in some people who did not want reined in. Some vampires who most certainly did not want reined in. He represented a threat to their individual power bases and a threat that was so consistent and was so clear over Neferata that he had to be removed. But the problem with removing a vampire of this puissance and one that's so beloved is that, well, you kind of can't, particularly given that he's already shown to be someone of extraordinary intellect, someone who immediately, passionately stepped into that court in a way that blew them away. He is not a minor character in terms of his small c character. He has an, a presence, an aura that others find very difficult to stand against because, because he's also clever and he's also probably right. And that makes it hard for those sniveling little voices to influence the queen. So I, I fully not just support the off to Cathay, off to others. It seems to be something that also makes sense because the court, as it stood, is poisoned and broken. And someone like Vashinesh is almost certainly going to unpoison it and unbreak it. So, get him the hell out of there. 
Yeah, and this actually um, lines up with, although we never got the book about it because Josh Reynolds, uh, the, the world blew up before uh, the book was able to be written in time, but um, there was an intended to be a book that featured on Aberash where there was going to be a bit of a focus about Aberash's and Vashanesh's relationship where Vashanesh was the only vampire that deeply agreed with Aberash uh, because Aberash was very chivalry minded uh he was a warrior that followed a very strict honor code where yeah. aberash did not approve of the other vampires just like sating their urges and feeding on random people and indulging a lot of the cruelties that vampires can fall into he wanted them to follow a very strict code of ethics vasanesh likely not only seconded this but as king was able to enforce it mm -hmm. which would have pissed off uh, the other uh four like neferata of course would have been probably relatively fine with it but Harakte, um, Matt Mises, Ushorin, and Wazorin? No, 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 no. Big nose on them. Yeah. So totally. Vashnesh had to go. And it's likely that he got sent out as a diplomat and it was seen as a good thing. Because, hell, having a diplomat in the courts of Grand Cathay, that's huge. That's a mm -hmm. major power thing for Lamia. That's incredible wealth. That's incredible power and influence. Grand Cathay is a massive empire. But it also means Vashnesh is gone. Yeah, I will add a couple of extra potential caveats to that, just so that we try and ground this back into the Warhammer world and what is likely. So to do that, we need to withdraw slightly from this situation and say, well, what the heck is a vampire anyway? At its simplest point, hmm. we have got ourselves someone, in this case Neferata, who has taken the teachings of Nagash, who has in turn taken the teachings of Dark Elves, who are using dark magic. And they have used dark magic and mixed it with their own local practices and the practices they learned from elsewhere because of the good old influence of, well, as we know, good old Cetra, um, and pulled them back and created an elixir. And an elixir that is, to its core, riddled through with dark magic. Dark magic is at the heart of it. Now, the vampires in this era are not the vampires we get later. And it's important that we do make a differentiation here. The vampires that we have later are all cursed by various entities, depending upon which source you go with, but most certainly by Nagash. Um, they are definitely, at least twice, they are definitely <laughs> not the vampires that we have at the moment. So if this vampire, if Vashanesh, wanders to other courts, is he going to be perceived as something that is inherently corrupted and wrong? And this is a super important question, because if he pops over to Cathay, we all know what the Cathayans think about things that are, say, for example, tainted by the ruinous powers. They kind of don't like that stuff, but he isn't. The Dark Elves, are they tainted? He's in a somewhat similar place at this point. He is not the completely corrupted, weird things that vampires become later, although a large chunk of it is already in there. So there is most certainly a strain of believability at the moment that Vashanesh could walk those courts with his weird, let's say, needs, not needing to eat and drink normal food, mm -hmm. not needing to, not wanting to be out during the day. But it's the Warhammer world. It's full of crazy stuff anyway. So that is in of itself not something that would make you say, well, he couldn't do that job. I think the biggest impediment towards making that believable is that vampires are vampires and thus crazy corrupted. And at this point, there is a very clear line of argument you can make that they are yet to be crazily corrupted because the actual corruption of the line is actually about to happen. Yeah, there's also, there's a lot of really good writing that talks about that the curse of vampirism, as far as how it affects the mind, is that it's going to get you eventually, but it takes time. And people who are particularly willful, um, the curse of vampirism is very sinister in how it brings out some of your more negative traits. And we'll see what happens to Vlad in the end. Even Vlad gets got by the curse of vampirism as far as it's more sinister aspects but it takes four thousand years uh to really and i think i could argue he isn't that well we'll get to that when we get to that so <laughs> uh Vashanesh, very importantly is not in lamia and the fall of lamia happens so he's somewhere else in the world and he gets word from probably a very alarmed series of messengers that hey neferana says you need to come home right now kimri or kimri has united the rest of nehekara against us and they're coming to war against us and it looks bad so he makes his way home, and by the time he gets there, it's already over. Because the Siege of Lamia was 
horrible and ugly, mm. but it was relatively quick because they the vampires were just grossly outnumbered. Yeah. I and, mean, it's a lovely little line saying there's somebody who's like 10,000 to one outnumbered. Proper, proper, grossly outnumbered, yeah. um, which is super fun. There's also a couple of the older sources that place Vashness at that battle. So do be aware that if you go through some of the older stuff, you might pop up with a quick. And Vashness, um was one of the lords that escaped from Lamia because seven of them escaped. Um, and it's quite clearly stated that he was there. But be aware that this is sort of muddied and messed around and... Uh, in fact, to be fair, all of Vashnesh's history around this area is super weak and is super undetailed and is almost mm. certainly, if they ever visit it again, not just going to be rewritten. It's more likely to be written because there's so yeah, little That's a better way here. to put it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, There is just almost a Vashnesh sized hole inside this area because he is such an important character to Lamia, to vampires, that this hole almost makes no sense but it's most certainly there yeah so now we get to the part where vashness is actually written about quite heavily which yeah. is that he like all of the vampires because when they scatter from lamia it was not an organized scatter everyone just kind of went like ah because you know everything was on fire and burning and stuff and they were trying not to die uh because that's just how scary nehekara was at its height especially with alcatazar leading the charge so the vampires scatter and by this point, Nagash is keenly aware of their existence because yep. he has been having communications with Wazorin. So he knows what's up. So good old Wazorin. So Nagash, <laughs> using his power, now that Nagash is very, very strong up in his fortress and Nagash's are, he is pretty much fully established now. He uses his sorcery to put out a call. And he basically um, is able to reach out to what makes vampires vampires because ultimately they're... Um, what they are derives from his own power in a sense. And Nagash is aware of that and is so goddamn strong he knows how to manipulate it. He calls them all to him. And it's not like they hear a voice in their head that's like, hey, come to my house now. It's more like an impulse. Like there's something where they're like, ooh, I... They wake up there like, I don't know why, but I need to go to this mountain. I don't think it's even that conscious. They just go. Um, yeah. And what's particularly fun about this particular area is it's been written again in different ways by different authors. Some have clearly said that Nagash had corrupted the elixir that had been used by Neferatus since day one. Others are somewhat more cagey with exactly what's going down here others suggest that perhaps nagash just basically being nagash figures it out and goes hey yes i'll be using that thank you very much so <laughs> so less of a the vampires were his creation more of a the vampires are there i can use that and let's be very very blunt here vampires are freaking rock hard they are arguably mm. the hardest of all the undead by not just a slight bit, an enormous amount. They are stupendously powerful in comparison to anything else that even comes close to them. And the most powerful of the vampires are leaps and bounds ahead of the other vampires as well. And these are the master vampires, the very first of them getting summoned up along with whatever stragglers may be kicking around of which there are almost certainly quite a few because as oh, we yeah. find out in the wars there's all manner of vampires all over the place so the whole concept of the blood kiss and everything else hasn't just been done over in Lamia and then they were all killed no that's not the case as they've come out there's a variety of them that eventually fall underneath Nagash's sway and Nagash being Nagash he chooses someone the most appropriate person to be their leader. Yeah, so as just a quick aside, I would love if someone would make the meme of the really famous internet meme of someone being like, I made this, and then they hand it to a friend. They go, I made this. And the guy goes, you made this? I made this. That's the gash in this, <laughs> in this circumstance. Yeah. So I, um, I just as a small aside, exactly yeah, on ahead. that point, um, I do think that if we are looking to build a compelling and interesting story, the more we make it, it was all Nagash all along, the weaker we make this story. Because it doesn't make Nagash look stronger to have done everything all the time. It makes him look almost comical 
And uh, if that's the case, then why did he fuck everything else up so much? Because he really does. So him taking control of the vampires should be seen as a great triumph of Nagash so that he can then fight back against Alcazar the dick down in the south, whom he hates. Um, and we'll learn to hate much more in time. Um, taking the vampires is a big thing. So trying to say that Nagash intended this all along, in some respects, makes his lack of use of the vampires before this point look stupid. Yeah, so I, I think I despise that version of the story. So yeah. making the story that Nagash is reaching out and he has he needs to control his vampires and he has found a method of doing so. And he uses Vashanesh to trick them. Yeah, and Here's something that's really interesting, and this is one of the big fuck up because it's Nagash. It, the best versions of Nagash is even when he's winning, he needs to fuck it up. And this is exactly what he does in this instance yeah. because before him are seven of the most powerful entities he has ever seen. They are almost as powerful as he is, and they're and they used a different form of the elixir of life, which is a huge accomplishment. Yeah. And he looks at this and he's very pleased, he's extremely happy. So he has these seven incredibly powerful new generals because he's like, okay, I'm putting you guys in charge of my shit. But he's like, ah, but I need one among them for a reason, which we'll get into in a second, because Nagash is very clever. However, Nagash is still human as much as he refuses to ever admit it. <laughs> and in this, Nagash does two really stupid things. The first is that he looks among them and he knows the story. Granted, he knows Wazoran's version of the story, which mm -hmm. is going to have some very notable edits. <laughs> but yeah, in, fair. <laughs> yeah. In his understanding, he knows Neferata made the elixir. He yeah. knows that Neferata is the first and that she is the leader among these vampires. So it would stand to reason that if he needs to pick one among them to be basically the high general, he should pick her, but he doesn't. And it's for two big reasons, which A, Nagash, whether you like it or not, Nagash is super fucking misogynist. It is a very well established part of his character. Uh, and it likely has a lot to do with his relationship to the priest cults because it's said in a lot of different sources that the lich priests are a male-only order. They can mm -hmm. only be men, uh, which is what caused a lot of problems for Neferata and led Neferata down the path that she goes. So there he already looks at her and is like, eh. And the second thing is he figures out very quickly that Vashanesh is a direct descendant. So not only is he... <laughs> like, ah, uh, women, he's like, ah, nepotism. <laughs> so yeah. he looks at Vashanesh, who, granted, is very impressive, and says, you will be my general, which was a colossal miscalculation on Nagash's part, because the second he did that, he made Neferata his biggest enemy. Yep, and um, he also did not make Vashanesh a friend. Now, you might think immediately, oh, yeah, no, no, totally has. That, that this, this is looking good. Yeah, no. Um, because not only does he does this, he provides Vashanesh with an item that will become the great defining item of the character, the ring that is the ring of Vashanesh, um, which not only gives him the power to be the best general he possibly can be and bring him back to life, but has a subtle underneath power as well. All vampires do what he says, and he does what Nagash says. But It's in fact not just Nagash, though. It's also Arkham the Bloody Black. So by granting the vampire leader that he has chosen this great power, this great magical ring, which will ensure their victory over their hated enemy in the south, because don't just view this as Nagash has summoned them and he's taking control of them now. It's much more diplomatic than this. But Nagash is drawing together very powerful potential allies from the south. But being Nagash, he doesn't do the clever thing, which would be to arguably bring them on side because he trusts no one. No, he goes, well, they're undead, aren't they? Well, I control them now. And he uses the ring of Vashanesh to do this. And Vashanesh discovers this, well, not immediately, but relatively quickly because they are all directly now, to put a relatively nasty word in it, slaves to Nagash. And they, as the generals of Nagash's now burgeoning and growing armies are about to be heading back south to do the thing they probably would have wanted to do anyway, which is not just take out Lamia, but take out the whole kingdoms of what will be the kingdoms of undead later. Yeah, and it's it's fascinating to think that, A, I the fact 
gotta say, although we don't necessarily think about it a lot, Nagash is like a pretty impressive creator of magical artifacts. Like, god damn, is he good at god it? God damn. Um, I mean, that ring. Yeah, very impressive. And uh, and Nagash, like Andy said, was very sinister about it, where he literally presents the ring as purely a gift. That, hey, this will make you truly immortal. You cannot die as long as you wear it, and it will enhance your powers. And uh, I would, unfortunately, we don't have a story from his perspective, but you have to imagine how like... sinister it was for Vachines to discover what the ring actually is meant for. In yeah. that he gives orders and at first maybe thinks, oh, they're following because they want to, but is learning, no, my wife is now my slave. All of my fellows, whether I like them or not, are now my slaves. They do exactly what I order them to, regardless if they want to or not. And then if Archon tells him to do something, or Nagash, he has to do it. And you have to think about how that Vashness is a relatively noble figure. What And think about what the vampires did after this, right? They're sent into yeah. Dehakara to kill everybody. What kind of atrocities were Archon and Nagash saying... No, you're not just going to beat them. You're going to brutalize these people because Nagash hates them and wants so revenge. Get that into your head. So we've got Vashanesh, who is at heart, at least in terms of how his character has been described, a noble king who is looking to not just understand humanity, but lead humanity to something better. He himself has seen the destruction of what he felt was going to be a successful situation um and as we know the vampires did not necessarily make it to anything that the good old priest kings were happy with um and he is now in a position where he is filled with a certain amount of uh, need for revenge for what was going in the south particularly because his wife wishes that revenge also he takes this on and he watches what was once his companions his friends potentially not just peers but enemies as well are now his slaves his wife is his slave, and he, in turn, is issuing orders which he himself does not like. And he's about to head towards a character choice which defines him. Absolutely defines him. And also is one of the reasons why it is certain that Vlad is Vashanesh. For all, there is a certain amount of push and shove by certain writers to try and pretend that isn't the case. Even the 8th edition Armulus says... No, no one knows where Vlad came from. He was just a Kislevite or something, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, nah. Um, he's of the, impor uh, the of the royal line of Sigmar. I find that much more interesting. Um, but we'll get to that very soon. He <clears throat> is now the general of Nagash's armies, and the vampires are leading the great undead forces that are heading their way south, including a whole bunch of rebels from the priest kings that we've discussed over in Nagash mm. thread. Um, but it is worth noting this battle's not going to go frightfully well. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is that initially, because, you know, fucking vampires. Vampires. Now, yeah. Backed up by Nagash's endless legions of undead. Nagara is completely fucked. Like, they do mm -hmm. not stand a chance against this. Uh, Alcazar the Conqueror is awesome, but he, even with his uh, tactical genius, he can't over, like, they're killing vampires. They're absolutely killing them, but yeah. he can't deal with all of them. And this is an organized assault, and it quickly starts building up to Vashanesh realizes that Alcazar is the problem, and Alcazar realizes that Vashanesh is a problem. And they start, their armies over the course of weeks are starting to maneuver towards one another, but Alcazar is doomed. He doesn't realize it, but he's doomed. Except Vashanesh starts looking at this situation in a different way which is that Vashanesh does not like the current circumstances and he wants out. And this is a big bit. Okay, so imagine if you can, the great conflict between Khemri down towards the south, or in fact, no, the whole kingdoms down towards the south, and Nagash. Uh, the war is going relatively well for Nagash. And I do say relatively well because there's various points where there's discussions about just how many losses that they are receiving. Now, Vashanesh, who is completely under the control of this ring, does something that he should not be able to do. Now, there are two different versions of this particular story. We can go with story number one. Ding, 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 ding. Story number one says that Vashanesh wanders up to al -Kadazar. They have a fight and he just basically sticks his arms out and says, kill me. And he dies. But because he's wearing the ring, he'll come back. That story makes no sense. <laughs> no, it 
doesn't at all. Literally none. <laughs> because the ring will bring him back again. And indeed, as has been discussed in some of the stories already, the ring had done so at various battles. It's why Vashanesh was so bloody feared. Not only was he an extraordinary general, he just doesn't die. The other story, though, is this. He takes the ring off. And then he lets al Qadazar cut him down. So he's dead. The ring's power is gone. His Don't wife, <laughs> his wife is free. She can go and do what she wants to do. Vashanesh takes the hit on the chin, lets himself die, and it is now the end of his story. Job done. We're out of here. Now, a couple of later writers have uh, often come in and said something like this. Oh, but the ring brought him back because Vashanesh is Vlad. Yay! Um, and that particularly popped up, as I believe, in Night's Dark Masters. That's how mm. it, it pitched it. Okay, but that story actually makes no sense. What makes more sense, and what has to be the case if Vlad is Vashanesh, is that whatever is in this ring, the power of its um, ability to resurrect, had to be broken. He had to remove it. Yeah, I wanna... What brought him back is more likely to be what he is. Yeah, I want to jump in real quick just to clarify for those listening. So the, the reason this is so important is when Vashanesh dies, however he did die, it severs the connection of the ring. So that Nagash no longer controls him, and he no longer controls all the vampires, which allows the vampires to scatter, which they do. Literally, oh every boy, single, do they? Yeah, every single vampire realizing they're free, they all abandon Nagash except for Wazorin. Um, now what's weird and the reason andy says the story doesn't make sense the way it's told now because it doesn't is that in the current version it quite literally says vashanes fights alcatazar allows himself to get beheaded or whatever and when he dies the connection is broken for some reason but you have to remember the ring is designed to bring him back to life and he's already died a couple of times with it on so why this time does it like what like it doesn't make any fucking sense at all so the only way the story makes sense is Vashanes had to allow himself to genuinely die. That's the sacrifice. And that he doesn't know, well, granted, he probably had contingencies, but he didn't know for certain whether he would come back. He was willing to allow himself to die to free Neferata, to free his people. Mm -hmm. um, even if he doesn't like a couple of them, he makes this sacrifice of it's worth dying for the greater good and he goes up against Alcazar. they have an epic fight and to be fair Vashanes sells it like he doesn't just like walk up and is like oh I'm just not gonna fight they have an epic battle and Vashanes pulls the he just on purpose raises his sword a little too slow that one time and gets his mm -hmm. head chopped off so um what is certain and what we need to completely make clear as we draw clothes on Vashanesh's tail and we drop into our next set of super chats um, is that come the end of this battle, Vashanesh has died, and Vashanesh's link to all the other vampires that the ring that he was carrying put in place comes to an end. The vampires scatter, and in his abject horror that they would betray him, Nagash curses them. The vampires, that is. Curses them hard for daring to betray him. Again, showing Nagash's extraordinary power over all these things. Now, it's also worth noting, before we get onto the curse, um, that Vashanesh may miss out on this curse completely because he's dead. He's, he's currently gone. He is out of here. Now, there's a few things we know about vampires. Um, we know that they can be brought back using a variety of different means. We know that there is no killing a vampire in truth. There is no way to do it. They're entirely material beings where their souls are trapped effectively in the material plane. There is nothing that lies beyond. Nagash has a similar issue where he'll keep on coming back again and again and again. Vampires are not so different. They don't know this. Vashanesh's sacrifice is, I believe, 100% real. He is not sacrificing himself with any real belief he's coming back. He is sacrificing himself to free all the other vampires and they sadly pay the cost for this. And Let's just get an idea of the type of guy that good old uh, Vlad is. Now, he does come back as far as we're concerned because it's Vlad to be. Vashanesh is going to be mm. Vlad. So he's coming back. Now, the gap between here and when he starts popping up and making his first fingerprints into history 
is not explained. How he comes back is not explained in most sources, although in one source it says it's because his ring brought him back. Makes no sense. Yeah, it's dumb. Um, we're we're going to say yeah. skip. <laughs> skip that one. Press the skip button. It didn't happen. Vlad comes back probably because of a mistake, a ritual, perhaps Neferata. Although if it's Neferata, I'm going to make a further suggestion, but I'll get to that in between. I have bit. a theory, but we'll yep. get to that. Yeah. We'll get to that. But before we do that, do you want to say anything about the curse of vampirism or will we jump into the uh, uh, chats? Uh, we'll, we'll jump into the Super Chats here in a second, but just uh, the only thing worth kind of adding is that for those that are curious what Nagash's curse was, uh, mm, Nagash, yeah, he, he, has a, he likes to theme his curses based on what's going on. And he says, uh, basically, Nagash declares, booming with his voice, which I love that GW now has a thing where they always do it in all caps and italicized <laughs> when, it's in, when Nagash talks in AOS. But he, he yells out that for their betrayal, uh, they will forever be scorched by the sun of Nehekara. They will never again get to bask in the light of uh, the sun that so gloriously defines the land of Nehekara. So he makes it where they can never stand sunlight. They will burn and they will die. And I love that. Um, now, we know already by this point, because the stories have made it relatively clear that the vampires kind of shun the sunlight anyway. But this basically makes it a thing. Before this, it isn't. And I think you can easily make an argument that Vladimir, not Neferata, is the true source of Genevieve's bloodline because of this. Hmm. But that... That is an aside, particularly given that Genevieve, if you don't know who Genevieve is, go read the Genevieve books, particularly because Genevieve's sire is male, which kind of ruins the whole Lamian thing anyway. Well, there um, are male Lamians, not a lot. There are, but, but, but they were added because they screwed up a couple of points rather than because that was their plan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. It's usually a crime. Watching the rewrites, watching the rewrites, <clears throat> they realize, holy crap, we've done a thing we shouldn't have. Oh, except for some of the men, what we have. Uh-huh, uh-huh, you screwed up that, didn't you? Um, but what the second they made Genevieve um, a Lamian, they had to accept men into the bloodline. They had no choice. Um, but I think you get a really strong argument there because her bloodline can also walk during the day. And I think there's a really nice little touch there because Vlad was dead. Yep. So uh, let's yeah. get caught up on Super Chat stuff and then we'll delve into the next part of the story. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. I love Vlad. Vlad's nope. best. Nope. Uh, let's see. Nope. And nope, nope, nope. and <laughs> I have to go. Oh gosh, no! Nope. It wasn't. We've had a bit of a break. Um, uh, between the last super chat. Sorry about that, folks. I'm a bit glad uh, we had quite a bit of Vashinesh stuff to cover first. The, okay, here we go. Here we go. See before and we all know that Vlad turns to his personal taxidermist criminal after everything. <laughs> Why a taxidermist besides criminal and Isabella? Who does he consider? Okay, who does Vlad consider a friend? That's a really hard question to answer because vampires have kind of a unique perspective on things like friendship. Um, it's heavily, heavily implied that him and Aberash were kind of close to being friends. Um, as close as maybe they could get. Um, but Vlad is Vlad's one of those characters that probably genuinely had friends that were human. Um, but unfortunately, we don't really get to see that many of them especially from his earlier life. And of course, most of them are probably dead by now, uh, by like the time he's in Sylvania. They're probably long dead. Um, but Vlad, like he inspired a lot of good in people for most of his life. Um, he likely had a lot of friends and lost a lot of friends, which is kind of plays into what he becomes later. Yeah, totally. I mean, <clears throat> um, uh, at their very heart, vampires are riddled through with dark magic. Dark magic ultimately corrupts and almost no matter who you are, it's going to come with some form of cost but um vlad is of all the vampires that we have encountered certainly the one that is most likely to have formed indeed does form relationships with others and i would argue that is ultimately his downfall yep jonathan scott it's understandable why vlad had such a chip on his shoulder you were two of the main thing you knew about people main thing people knew about you is that you suck <laughs> oh 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 so very funny with your jokes <laughs> Jonathan Scott, any insight on the implied plan Vlad had for taking after taking over the Empire? Also, how would he be interacted with other species slash Cathay if he had won? We will get to that because that's a core part of yeah, the Yeah, we're getting to that, Jonathan, and it's a, a very important part of the story we're about to hit into. 
So we're, we're going to take a pass on that one for right now just because we're going to get to that. Yeah, we will um, get to that. Hammond, if both of you had all the money in the world, all the minis and bits and talent, what kit bash mini would you create for Fantasy slash Age of Sigmar? Well, I'm very boring. Um, if I was going to make a kit bash mini and I just like had all the ability to make something absolutely beautiful and insane, my thing is I would just make a really, really impressive Lord Mazda Mundi model because he doesn't have an official model. And having like a big badass lawn riding on the biggest Stegodon in existence who and like i would just have him like in the middle of casting some crazy spell using a bunch of bits from various minis so there's magic all over him and like the mini and he's got all these skink attendants and stuff i'd go crazy with it but i have neither the money nor the bits nor the talent so that will never happen <laughs> yeah so um the last time i was uh, thinking about vlad i made a vlad model um because i didn't like their vlad model um and uh it was a proper swooshing cloak, whipping up like a Batman cloak type of um, version, which I <laughs> uh, obviously adored. I, I, it was done right after I'd had a discussion with Steve Savile, who'd written the Vampire Chronicles, about Vlad. And we uh, I discussed parts of what he'd done with the book and the bits that I liked and the bits I didn't like. And I said which bits I didn't like because I'm like that. Um, and he was all like, oh, yeah, I see. And I gave what I thought was an alternative. And he's like, oh, God damn, I wish I'd done that. And he told me the things that they couldn't do in the book as well. But he, at the end of that, had said um, we'd characterize Vlad as basically fantasy Heathcliff from quite literally Wuthering Heights, um, in that he was a brooding man um, with all of the troubles that he'd faced from his past that had turned him into a very different character in the future. Um, and uh, I, I built myself a miniature which looks somewhat like the picture that Mark Gibbons did for the third edition Undead Army List. Mark Gibbons was the first person to do a picture of Vlad where it was a far more classic vampire, high collar, swooping cloak, very broody type character with a stupid big sword, which indeed I wrote Timor Mortis on it because that was on the art. So <laughs> that's what I did. There you go. Uh, Viper Wolf, sorry I'm late. I was cutting down a tree. All right. Those well, trees need to be cut. W w welcome, George Washington, to the to the stream. We appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, Necromancer Cobalt, uh, I'm glad to see a great man, especially an undead one, who at least sips his respect women juice. Man, I almost read that in a very different way, which would have implied something way different. <laughs> and I was like, that's a weird super chat. And then that's, I that's that's a way. fun that, super chat you're doing there. Yeah, but no, I agree. <laughs> Particularly because so many of Games Workshop's characters have been written um in a very one-dimensional way it's nice to see a character that was most certainly a little bit more than just hey what they did with the priest kings in the gash for example um, he was vashanesh was most certainly a man ahead of his time yeah and it, it's it's really important that he be that way for the way his story plays out oh yeah um which is good vlad gets influence from elsewhere andy law 2024 <laughs> agreed yeah, thank you, Hammond. Uh, Mandatus Callum, I do love the Vlad and Isabella power couple, as many others here do. Intriguing he wasn't struck down in Cathay. Wonder what Yuan Bo and his dad thought. Uh, well, A, like Andy said, there's a lot of really interesting things to say whether he was necessarily detectable at that point, especially because mm -hmm. vampires were not a known thing. Uh, yeah. The vampires had not been introduced to Cathay yet. Obviously, they will become a problem for Cathay later, but uh, for them, they might have been more fascinated than anything, especially the Moon Empress would have probably had a very intriguing idea of vampires if they could identify him. But it's also quite likely that dealing with lich priests, that one of the first things the vampires would have to do is learn to conceal what they are, uh, which all vampires are capable of at least some magic. Uh, Vashinesh in particular is a very skilled wizard. Um, yeah, yes. Like he does not lack in the wizard category compared to like say Neferata and Aberash who really struggled uh, at wielding magic. Yeah, um, agreed. Agreed to all of that. I think... I think if we want to create a good reason for why he wasn't discovered, assuming that he walked the courts of Cathay, which I prefer to think that he did, because it really doesn't speak to him, doesn't speak well of him, but it also speaks well of Manfred, who will be taking on much of his legacy. Um, if you take a look at what he was at that point, it's before the primary curses have hit. It's when the elixir is at its peak, and he's the first taking it. In many respects, he is um, not the model of what will come later, 
He is ahead of that model. The vampires that are to come are not him. He is something different. Uh, he is obviously an entity that has been using dark magic, but that does not necessarily make you a creature of chaos or anything similar. So there is no reason for him to be called out as something that has to be destroyed, perhaps something to be wary of and uncertain of and to deal with carefully, but not necessarily something to kill. And I think you could create a particularly good story out of that one. Yeah, especially if you think about how cool that story is by David Geimer about you and Bo like having tea with the changeling. Imagine you and Bo having tea with Bastion Ash. It's a really cool like story because yeah, totally. they both would be exceedingly polite, but there would also be a lot of double meanings behind everything they're saying. And mm -hmm. watching Bastion Ash navigate Cathayan culture would be really fun. Mm -hmm. uh, Abyss Walker, Vlad start did Vlad start the Jade Blooded Vampire Bloodline? Possibly. It's is it technically possible in the strictest sense? Sure. But yeah. to be jade-blooded, you kind of, by definition, are a descendant of, I believe, Herakte. Um, Probably. Now, are there, by definition, Von Kar signs in Cathay? That's very, 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 very possible. Graham, yeah, I, I find that question fascinating, because I yeah. think that there is certainly at least another one or two bloodlines that are not Von Karsteins, but are pre-Karsteins. The Von Karsteins are a very recent addition to the whole vampire group. For all that we, yeah, I guess we'd label them descendants as Aber or Vashnesh, not yeah, technically totally. von Karstein. Um, yeah, the von Karsteins are just new. They're only like five hundred years old. They're they're barely anything in terms of the greater scheme of the world. So yeah, I think it's not just likely; it's very likely, particularly if we pop over to some of the potential places that Vladimir has been. Well, Vashnesh. Yeah. Yeah, but if you're if you're talking about the jade blooded specifically, those are 100% the descendant blood descendants of Harakte, but there yeah. is like very likely uh some descendants of Vashanesh over there. Yep. Uh Mandates, uh you pissed off my wife and what's this ring you've given me now? Yeah, that's the other thing is that Nagash probably didn't do himself any favor by sliding Neferata because just by doing so he is also sliding Vashanesh. But yeah. he's never he's Nagash. He doesn't give a shit. Yeah, Nagash got what he wanted. Um, he just didn't expect the extraordinary strength of will of Vashanesh. And I think that that is, that is Nagash's folly. Um, arguably, the Neferata choice, as far as he was concerned, was completely correct in that he was choosing his own bloodline. He trusted his own bloodline as much as one could trust anything, but he was still bringing it entirely under control. His mistake was not realizing just how bloody-minded Vashanesh was going to be. Yep. Um, it's also really interesting to think that Nagash probably legitimately doesn't understand uh, romantic connections like there's a lot of very strong indications that Nagash is not just he's essentially a romantic um, not not in that that's a negative aspect of him but he just genuinely does not understand those kinds of human connections the power of love um, yeah so yeah he doesn't recognize that the power of love will be able to overwrite his magic yeah uh, the Sinch Master, from Nagash's point of view, a ring of nigh total dominance of the undead was probably a very thoughtful gift with his megal uh, megalomaniacal outlook uh, I agree. He probably, even though there was a kind of contingency involved with it because Nagash isn't dumb and doesn't want to make a potential rival, um, to, from Nagash's perspective, it is a kingly gift. Like, I don't think he viewed himself as like, haha, I'm pulling one over on them as much as, uh, no, you have the honor of essentially being one of my Mortarks. You must be, you must be deeply humbled. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, I've, from the Gash's perspective, he was elevating uh, Vashanesh. From Vashanesh's um, perspective, uh, Nagash was enslaving his wife and everything that he held beloved. Vashanesh did not see it as a good thing. Nagash almost certainly thought it would be perceived as such a thing. Because, hey, yeah, you need to accept orders from him and from good old Arkan the Black. But, you know, that's almost nothing in the greater scheme of things. And besides, you'd be doing that anyway because Nagash and Arkan are basically the same person as far as Nagash is concerned. Anything Arkan does is what Nagash wants anyway. So loosely speaking, you're just doing Nagash's will and Nagash is the best of them all, right? You're you're my vassal. Away you go do your thing. There's I'm very little about there. World peace. <laughs> yeah, totally. Total world peace and you're going to be at the head of this. Go, Vashanesh. Go do the right thing. But Vashanesh could not perceive it in the same way as Nagash. They have such a different set of moral values. And it's fair to say here 
that for all we love to say, vampires, corrupted, terrible, not fashionish, at least not at this point. All of him is obsessed by his love and his great desire for, one could argue, freedom. We've got that earlier character trait of his willingness to travel, to learn, to completely comprehend things. He is, he is a, he's a pretty troubled soul, and Nagash did not win that fight. Yeah, uh, there's actually kind of an interest. It's also worth noting that this is a big turning point for Nagash when Vashanesh betrays him, which you can go check out on our Nagash stream. Of Vashanesh's betrayal is so cutting to Nagash mm -hmm. that this is literally the moment where he goes, my mistake was allowing free will. Yep. I will never allow free will again. He that barely allowed free will anyway. Yeah, I know. He's like, that little <laughs> bit that I gave him. <laughs> How what dare the hell? Oh, uh, Nagash. Yeah, good old Nagash. Uh, Matthew Griffin, rings, Franz. They revive in response to death. Yep. Uh, Mandatus Callum, doesn't Manfred have a quote where he says, though Vlad loved Isabella the most, he uh, he loved he loved me first. And aren't Manfred's own origins obscure? Yes and yes. We'll talk about that very, very shortly. Hang very, on. yeah, yeah, Super yeah. Super shortly. Yeah. Um, Durthu's manservant, if Neferod in some alternate universe killed Isabella, would Vlad hunt her down? And if so, would she survive? If she had, uh, that actually will come up as a very interesting nugget when we get yeah, to Yeah, that's Isabella. a nugget near the end. Yeah. Stay tuned. Mm. Stay tuned. Yeah. Uh, just got some Blood Knights. Any fun ideas for them? Uh, like the actual models, I mean, I just love the way they look, and I'm yeah, they're good models. Kid, so I would just do it basic, but maybe look into if you want to be super. Uh, I forget what they call it, but you can get like little prints of like sticky things that you put on that you can paint over, so you can have like transfers. symbols on their shields. Yeah, transfers, uh, transfer sheets. So you could maybe look up some cool ones to get some cool symbols on there representing something like a particular idea or nation or whatever, or like you know, paint exotic colors or give them bloody fangs. That's also a classic. I actually like the Blood Knights the way they look. I'd probably paint them that way. Yeah. Sean Schultz, what's mm. a vampire's favorite holiday? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Hey. <laughs> what are you thankful this year? Um, uh, Neferata was just mad Nagash put a ring on her man. <laughs> you know what? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. <laughs> yeah. Not wrong, CB4N. Nagash was weak. Witness true power. I, I always love the amount it's of shit. power of love. I'm, I always love the amount of shit-talking characters do about Nagash when he's not around. <laughs> all right, so first, thanks for all those. Really yes, appreciate the Super Chats. Thank you. Um, the next arc, the effectively, the space of time between Matanesh and the rise of Vlad over in good old Drakenhof is enormous. It's huge. It's a yawning blank space, which we have a couple of details we can drop in. But I think we can also discuss a couple of things that it immediately tells you about Vashinestro Vlad and what has become the important points of his life. So I, I have one thing I want to insert. Back? Back? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's what we need to tackle real quick. That's why, that's why so, I was about to pass over to you because yeah, I know you so, have something you'd like to add there. Yeah, I have a theory here which is that there's no evidence for this. It's literally just a theory. Ha, ha. Uh, for those who get it, get it. Um, so um, Manfred, we do not know when Manfred von Karstein gets picked up by Vlad. Um, we, yep. we vaguely know the circumstances uh, seem to imply that Manfred was essentially an urchin. Um, just like a, he, he was quite young, uh, supposedly initially, and discovered by Vlad, and there was something about him that Vlad or Vashnesh was like, ah, uh, I see potential here. Because Vashnesh, Vashnesh was, uh, the way the vampires choose who gets the blood kiss is very unique depending on each of the vampires. Um, they have their own kind of qualifications. For instance, Wazoran only turns people that impress him uh, with their ability over magic or their knowledge for sorcery and stuff like that, or their hunt and desire for knowledge. Neferata tends to turn uh, only she did turn a couple guys and it did not turn out well for her so she went women only after that um but uh uh she looks for very particular traits within women uh before she turns them uh based on uh how capable they are uh, how uh manipulative they could be how careful they could be as well as looking for a lot of really interesting unique traits Neferata actually has probably the most fascinating mental map when it comes to whether or not to turn someone Vashinesh, uh early on seemed to look for genuine potential mm -hmm. in a kind of a more classic Western sense of like looking for people who have the potential to be great. 
Um, and Manfred very much fell under that category. Someone that he could see a hunger to be something important, to be something big. And But once again, we have no idea when Manfred met Vlad. We don't know if he met him back in Nehekara or if he met him while he was traveling the world, while he was in Kislev. Uh, we know that it was before he goes to Sylvania because we do have quotes from Manfred that Manfred is the oldest okay. that has been with Vlad for the longest. So yep. he is like, of the vampires that are still around, uh, by the time that Vlad really gets set up in Sylvania, um, Manfred has been around for a long time. So it's possible... Um, it's not stated anywhere, but it's possible if you want to really build up the connection between Manfred and his Vlad, because there's a there's a huge tragedy there, which we'll talk about a little later. We're not going to focus on it a ton because it's more of Manfred's story, but there is a tragic story between Manfred and Vlad where Vlad genuinely, deeply, unironically views Manfred as his son and loves him. Loves, like, I have to get that through DL's head. As much as people like to meme on Manfred, Vlad yep. loved him, which makes what happens really fucking heartbreaking. And I have a theory in that one too. We'll get yeah. to it when we get there. Yeah. And <laughs> it's very, very possible, though not directly stated anywhere, that Manfred was already a vampire by the time that Vashanesh dies uh, and cease, essentially ceases to be Vashanesh uh, and is killed against Alcazar the Great, which could lead that Manfred, being his son who loves him, who at this point, Vlad prob or Vashnesh probably loves more than anyone, probably even more than Neferata, Um, because frankly, especially when he starts world traveling, he doesn't get to spend that much time with his wife anymore. And it's kind of implied they start to grow distant. And although he makes this great sacrifice for her, he when he comes back, he doesn't really seem to seek her out. Uh, which I've we'll got a theory on that one too. That's one of my in betweeny bits I'm going yeah, to cover. Yeah. So I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll let Andy do all his in betweeny bits. So I'm going to knock mine out real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so my personal theory, if you really want to, which I like to build up the tragedy of Manfred's story, is that when Vlad Vashanesh dies, Manfred is already a vampire. And Manfred witnesses his father die and becomes obsessed with bringing his father back. And it's Manfred, Manfred the Acolyte, as he's known at this point until later, who is the one that ultimately finds a way to bring his father back which actually would tie in really well to the end times because Nagash uses Manfred to resurrect Vlad from true death in the end times and somehow even uses that to bring back Vlad's ring. So there's actually a canonical already statement that Manfred could be the key to true resurrecting Vlad and curing the ring of its flaw. Yeah, so um, I have a theory on this one as well. And Sotek has pretty much covered it. Um, in that, I am quite convinced that if I were to be picking this one up, it would be Manfred that brings back Vladimir. And that Manfred is already a vampire. And that Manfred had been freed from the curse that he was under. Um, as in freed from the ring of Vashanesh. Um, by Vashanesh's actions, Vashanesh dies. And Manfred becomes obsessed in bringing dad back. Because he wants him back. Because he believes that he is properly a, a good vampire a good man because they don't even yeah. necessarily consider themselves vampires per se he is the rightful and he just look what he just did he just freed his own peoples and the gash cursed them hard um for what they did including good old manfred including eventually when he comes back at some point fashionesh himself um we have ourselves um I think, a clear and clean story to have here because it links the pair of them together much more strongly and it allows the later events to have a greater poignance and a nastier outcome, really. It makes the story better and deeper. Um, I think it's quite likely that Manfred not just appeals to Vladimir, um, to Vashanesh, um, they are almost akin to each other in so many ways. Um, they both have this great need to learn, to understand, and arguably of the two of them, Manfred is by far the better necromancer. He understands the ins and outs of magic much more deeply, but you could also argue that to a degree that means he's a little bit more lost to the dark magic as well, which loves you, gives you a, a lovely little bit where he can be more easily blinded by someone like Nagash, which is kind of lovely in and of itself. All we know for certain, and I'm going to say this with even 
even that with a certain amount of wibbly wobbly hands because we can't say for certain Vashanesh is Vlad, but all we can say for certain <laughs> is that Vashanesh comes back at some point. Manfred is made Manfred at some point, long before Vlad is part of the picture, as in Vladimir von Karstein. Um, we can also say for certain that the von Karsteins exist before this. The von Karsteins are an established imperial line. They are no different mm -hmm. to say, for example, the young Freuds that you find over the, the Gormans, the Toddbringers, the various other big bloodlines that you'll be aware of kicking across the empire. And they believe they're directly descended from Sigmar. They are from the original stock of the empire. They have been kicking around for a very long time. And the fact that both Vlad and Manfred take that name is enormously fascinating not only does it give them a potential legitimacy when they start doing whatever it is that they start doing over in sylvania which we will get to and to a degree it does but they inveigle them their way into this bloodline and they take on all of its traits or did they help establish it were they there right at the very mm -hmm. beginning anyway yeah. this is the gap that we need to fill and this is where i'm going to move on to my slightly more dodgy version of what i think happens so we have got a huge gap of time, not a small gap. It's enormous. Yeah, we like know what, Manfred like three thousand years. Yeah, 1, it's years? Yeah, it's a long for time. Ever. Now we could possibly take up some of this <clears throat> with M Manfred resurrecting Vlad. It might take centuries. It could take longer. Who can say? It could basically take a very long time. But that's still many, many, many more centuries to go after that, where Vashanesh is potentially wandering the world doing stuff. We have various mentions of Vlad Vashanesh doing some things around about the 1100s, possibly kicking over to Kislev, possibly doing a couple of things here yeah, so or there. I will note, he does have a canonical appearance in Kislev during the fall of, after, immediately after the fall of Morkane. Indeed. Um, and there's a host of places that he pops up here and there. So we get some sort of loose dating. We also know that he makes a relatively strong connection through to the Strigony because he ends up using the Strigony for a variety of things. But perhaps just picking up an already broken people and trying to bring them into a better place, particularly given where the Strigony come from. In some respects, he'll view them as his responsibility because they are peoples that came from a shattered, vampire, human, potentially successful city that broke because of the Greenskins. Um, or because of other things, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> but never run a <laughs> but they, are, they are part of his potential responsibility. So all of that makes sense. His fingerprints are spread throughout history. But what doesn't happen is he doesn't go back to Neferata. He doesn't top 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 all the way over there and go hey baby i'm back yeah so the question is why and that is where we need to start thinking about who is he and what has happened and also who is neferata and what has she become mm -hmm. so my argument would be and this is at best a loose argument that he has had this enormous love that he died for and that time has passed and he comes back and he goes to see her without her being aware of it and is appalled at what she has become. This great beauty has devolved into a vampire. A vampire who is acting like a vampire, attempting to manipulate and control elsewhere. Vashanesh at his heart is not that sort of character. If anything, he is a man who is troubled by deep abiding loves, by his desperate attempt to lead and do the right thing, and an intellect that gets in its own way in many respects. He's too clever for his own good. He makes mistakes, of course, and he sees her, and that is when that love cracks. It cracks because Neferata is no longer the woman he fell for. Neferata has moved on, and she's now a creature that's filled with all manner of dark needs, people to crush, things to destroy, revenge to be had. Yeah, and it's worth noting as just a very brief aside of what Neferata was up to since Vashnesh's death, because it's worth noting that A, be, whether she thinks about it consciously or not, Neferata perceives Vashnesh's death as a betrayal. She, that he left her. Mm. That him accepting the ring from Nagash and dying, even though he died for her, uh, based on everything that we can look at from the story, she views it as a man betrayed me. Uh, 
And she holds that against him. And A, that part of the legacy might have gone back to him. But the thing she does in the immediate aftermath is that she conquers by weaving her way into civilizations and kind of yeah. para- you know becoming a parasite and manipulating them into things that she wants them to do, which brings ruin. First, she goes to Araby, uh, which eventually is what kind of draws the likes of Aberash and much, much worse case scenario, Archon over there, where Archon, Archon initiates the Wars of Death and obliterates Araby from its golden age. Like, Araby's golden age is ended very likely because Neferata got involved. And then she goes to Sartosa, which is what lures Setra the Imperishable to Sartosa, yep. and he obliterates it. Yep. Then, she, and like, every time she goes to a human kingdom, she ends up inviting ruin because there are enemies of hers that are drawn to it, and she doesn't protect them. That's not what she's interested in. And Vashinesh is someone clever enough to not only recognize her fingerprints on things, but he would be able to follow everywhere she's going and seeing she is bringing death to so many people. And instead mm-hmm. of like protecting humanity or raising humanity up, she's dragging it down for her own personal empowerment. Like she is directly, you could argue, uh, she's partially responsible for the fall of Araby and the fall of Sartosa at, in their golden ages but she is directly responsible for obliterating Stragos, which yep. she was had a good thing going, to be completely really did. clear. Like, Ushorin, he learned from his mistakes and was genuine, though, granted, the crown of the gash was starting to do bad things to him. He was doing good things, and because she just was bitter towards her brother and envious that he was trying to recreate Lamia and kind of doing it better than she was, the, uh, because he had gotten rid of some negative influences, she obliterates an entire nation out of spite. And Vashinesh looks at that and goes, this is not the woman I married. Yeah. Um, and I, I would go, I, there's different ways we could handle this. We could have it happen like this. He wakes up, all of this has happened, he views it, is utterly surprised, goes to see her, she's exactly what he feared she had become. Or alternatively, um, he gets to see that teased out in front of him over time. I personally prefer the one where he wakes up long after. Manfred, mm. now his own man, having had freedom for potentially centuries. And he has learned two things. Thing number one, how to bring Vlad back. Thing number two, how to remove the curse from the ring, which is an essential component. The curse that means that when it's worn, all vampires fall underneath the control of the bearer. Because we know this ring is coming back and Vladimir does not call on all vampires to come to his side because they must. Okay, so the curse is gone. And if anyone is going to remove it, that curse, it's Manfred. I mean, he Manfred, as we will cover in another stream, Manfred's pretty good at this stuff. It's yeah, very much, yeah. it's very much his thing. Um, so Manfred is, this is where, in my version at least, Manfred has very much built his character and who he is going to become. And Vladimir wakes up, filled with all of his useful ambition, filled with all of his horror and hatred of what just happened at the war. <laughs> and filled... Manfred's like, it's just us, Dad. <laughs> it's yeah, just you and me quite. now. Uh, and then he goes to go back to Neferata to finally say, look, love, the back. And finds a horror show in comparison. And his heart is completely broken, which immediately gives you a strong reason for the centuries of brooding and wandering that follows. He's broken, actually broken. And I'm going to pitch something that many of you may go, you fucking what now? For what happens when he eventually arrives in Drac. Because when he eventually arrives over by Drakenhof, we are going to have a new story, and Manfred's character, well, Manfred, pardon me, Vlad's character is not just going to change, it's going to start off as it always was, and then it's going to hike it left field and become completely different. And I'm going to give you my reason for why I think that is. It matches all of the story that's there, but it is not the same as the story yeah, that's there. there. We have to make one quick pick stop. Uh, We've got a couple of pick stops, I think. Yeah, so, the well, there's one important one. Uh, so we know that he wanders for a while, which makes mm-hmm. sense that if he's like, all right, you know what? I'm going to let Vashinesh die. I'm going to let this age die. I'm going to take my son and whatever few acolytes, you know, they have, and they just wander. And they explore many different human realms. Um, and the important thing is that Vlad studies humans. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's likely that he has encountered plenty of dwarves and elves. Like he talks about them. He knows about them. He knows how they work. Vlad is actually very clever when it comes to elves and dwarves, which we'll talk about a little later. Uh, but he mostly is studying humans. And what's cool about Vlad is he's not just studying them from a distance. He goes and lives among them. He yeah. engrosses himself in their culture. And we know that he goes to multiple different cultures to study their strengths and their flaws and is basically kind of gathering all of the best bits of humanity and the worst bits and trying to get a full picture of what defines humanity, which is fascinating. Now, in terms of how he lives, it's worth saying that this is where Vlad is probably going to be at his most Dracula. Now, I might be called out for calling out such things, but this is where we say, yeah, Vlad is just Dracula. That's basically who he is. That's who he always was. That's what he was based on. I know we've managed to avoid saying it up to this point, but just put a little V at the end instead of a D, and you've pretty much got... It's not a big mystery. (laughs) It's not a big mystery, indeed. He's the second character in Warhammer to be directly based on Dracula. The first was Drakenfels, who also signed with a D, who was based directly on Dracula. And that's Dracula, the character from Bram Stoker, not the character of, say, for example, Vlad Tepes or anything similar from history. Although you might immediately go, Vlad Tepes? What? Yes, Vlad the Impaler. That's where Vlad gets his name from. Yada, 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 yada. Which is whom Dracula was based on in turn. So Vladimir is at his most Dracula at this point. And by that, I mean he is an art- aristocratic gentleman that moves from place to place um, and is as far as he's concerned, pretty much better than everybody else, studying humanity as what they are, which to him is a lesser creature filled with fascination and potential. And amongst them, there are the Manfreds. There are the people that are worth picking up and turning into something better to hopefully better people as a whole. Remember, this hikes back to his original sensibilities all the way back in Kemri. He is effectively a priest king of some sort. He is a leader. He views the people, the peasantry, as his flock. And that very quickly turns into my flock that I tend for very good reason because I need their blood. And you can see the the creature that he is going to become very much in the era that we have here. But imagine him like Dracula wandering from place to place, like any dodgy movie you saw from the 80s where the vampire comes to town. But don't think of him as the cackling, oh, 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 hey, I'm a vampire. I must take this woman. Oh, oh, oh. Um, he's a far more intelligent, erudite, careful, potentially tea stroke blood supping style of vampire. He is the classic aristocratic gentleman. And to a degree, that's what he starts off with when we move into our our next phase. Yeah. And uh, and through this, there are two things that he likely witnesses that are going to inform what he does later, which is, A, he's witnessing that humanity has potential, but is also kind of stupid and helpless. Uh, yeah. And there are threats that humanity are ill-suited to defend themselves against. And there are two of them primarily that Vlad witnesses a lot of, which is chaos, which Vlad hates because he recognizes it for the threat that it is. Vlad, of all the vampires, there is no vampire that takes as staunch of a position against chaos as Vlad. He despises it because Vlad honestly seems to deeply enjoy civilization and see the potential in order, especially in humanity's order. But in order to do that, chaos has to be defeated as a threat. And he takes that very, very seriously. You get the strong feeling that the original Lamian ideal of the undead lords leading the people and being able to protect them better and the people, they feed from the people and in turn protect the people. He's a classic noble. Um, And whilst Lamia may have collapsed as an experiment and later vampiric experiments or attempts to recreate Lamia may have failed as well, that doesn't mean it won't work. The idea that the vampire lords can rule over humanity benevolently appears to be potentially his. It appears that the Lamian project that it became was him. He went to the queen and went, you can do this better. We can be better. And you can see why the other vampires weren't necessarily up for that sort of thing. Um, And Later, we have Strigos and we have Murkane and all the rest but, of it. But you can see it impacted like Ushorin. Like Ushorin yeah. took it seriously after the fall of Lamia and nearly succeeded. Totally. Um, yeah. And and I think that that is uh, an important character trait that 
probably came from Vashanesh. It absolutely matches all of the character beats that we've had up to this point. And then what we see from Vlad before it begins to degrade big time. And the great betrayal that will come from him, which we will, of course, cover, and why it comes. Yeah. And then the second thing that uh, I just want to touch on very briefly is it's very important that Vlad likely sees the predations of vampires during this time, where he sees vampires that are ugly types of vampires. Either some of his progeny who don't handle the blood kiss well and they become something bad, or very likely seeing other bloodlines and what they've become. Because the next time we pick up with Vlad is in Kislev, where Vlad has taken up residence. And he's like essentially a minor noble uh, in a little oblast area. He's part of Kislevite society. And he gets a very strange set of visitors, which are the Strigoi. Because Strigos has fallen. The Greenskins wiped mm -hmm. it out. Ushorin is believed dead. Uh, whether he is or not depends on the story. But they have all fled. And all of the other vampire bloodlines are hunting them. Um, the the uh, the Lamians are constantly seeking them out and making sure they can't put down roots anywhere or else they'll tell the nearby humans so they'll come attack them. The Blood Dragons are hunting them for sport. The uh, Necrarchs are trying to capture them to experiment on them. So they, they discover Vashanesh or Vlad because they recognize him, which is fascinating to think about because that means there are some of them that are old enough to know who he is even though he did not go to Stragos. And they go and they appeal to him, and he looks at them and sees them for what they are. He recognizes the corruption that is yeah. already in them by the time they arrive. Because remember, they went all the way from the marshes of, essentially the marshes of madness, all the way up to Kislev, which is a long fucking trip. And he casts them out because he see, he knows that they are a threat. He even kills quite a few of them because he recognizes that whether he can't save them and they are devolving into beasts and they will be a threat not only to him, but likely his people, which even though he may view them as kind of a resource, that's still a threat that needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there we go. We've got ourselves Vashanesh. Now we know that from various sources that Vashanesh is Vlad, but we also know from various sources that he isn't. Um, but what we can say with, again, pretty much certainty is that um, the ch character of Vashanesh during the course of this time doesn't change. What does change is everyone else. Vampires have begun to devolve. His erstwhile allies and friends are becoming monsters. Everything that he loved is no longer in place. The only thing that's really certain in his life is Manfred, and they are continuing to wander thither and yon. And for some reason or another, they choose to stop. Now, before we get to that, we have a few super chats we should probably bring up. Yep. And then we're going to be hitting the gas really hard. Um, yeah. Mm. yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, for Cole, go look at uh, Champions of Undeath mod. Sure. I, oh, for you, I think Cole is someone else in chat. But hey, yeah, that was a really cool mod. Uh, what book series did Vlad say it's Morbin time? Uh, it's a lost <laughs> book. It's it's special collectors these days. Uh, T Ball thirty one. Where's the part stolen from Michael Moorcock? None of it. It all came Take from Bram Stoker this time. <laughs> yeah, 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 different author. Uh, Mandatus Callum. Point well understood. Uh, so tech as Manfred in times meme is not the same as Manfred of fantasy to me, and it's an awesome character. Then there are a couple of moments in the end times where Manfred is great, especially like in the earlier books. Um, but yeah, book five did not handle Manfred well at all. Because they oh no, you're making though. me angry again. Let's just yeah. not anyway, think about on. that. Mark key eighty three. Uh, how does the ring actually work? Like, because I locked. So the von Karstein ring, as it's known nowadays, it has essentially an enchantment where you can kind of think of it as like it's a it's a lifeline that repairs the body, so to speak. It uses magic to repair any damage. So as long as he's wearing the ring, it doesn't matter how you kill him. You can obliterate him. You can rip his head off. Like. Theoretically, if there isn't like an atom of him left on that ring, it will regenerate his body from scratch. Now, it doesn't happen immediately sometimes. How long it takes seems to depend on the damage. There have been times where like his head gets blown off and he's already back by the end of that same battle. There have yeah. been other times where he gets like ripped in half and it takes him like two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually it puts him back together and resurrects him. Not by like dragging the pieces in, but just by like rebuilding him. 
and it's completely within the standard necromancy lore for this to work. Just look at other characters who've managed to revivify, rebuild themselves. Plus, there are various vampires that die that are brought back because vampirism, by its very nature, confers an immortality that's much more deeply embedded than many realize in the Warhammer world. Yep. Uh, Zarn 94, thank you very much. I picked a good stream to give uh, my Toon King's army a break and work on my Neferata and lead, uh, to lead my soul blight. Her and Kalita's story got me into Warhammer and Vlad being involved makes me appreciate him a lot more. Thanks. Yeah. Ah, oh, man. I would give anything to have a story where, like, Neferata is reeling from what goes down with Kalita, where she, Kalita essentially suicides herself to stop being forced to be with Neferata for eternity and Vashnesh yeah. having to, like, take care of his wife who's grieving the loss of someone she loves. Agreed completely. Uh, Good story uh, in that one. Yeah. How would Ulrika react to Vlad? Uh, funny you uh, mentioned that. That actually full on happens. Um, Ulrika is gets like she signs up with Vlad in the end times. Uh, he takes her in and she respects him immensely because she which again speaks to his true character, which I think we're going to have to discuss yeah. as we do the Vlad buttons. <laughs> Clear through all. Sure, it lives justice for Stragos. Cancel Neferata, that no, bitch. Sure. <laughs> All right, yeah. so uh, in the interest of time, let's keep moving. So, Sylvania, we're finally here. It's finally ah. <laughs> We're only one hour, 40 minutes into the yeah. stream when we finally get to the topic at hand. Yeah, Vlad von Karstein. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I have a couple of bits to just drop in right at the very beginning. Um, so Sylvania at this point is a part of the world that has already got many a dark story attached to it it's a deeply forested area where according to some stories vlad to be vashanesh has already passed through and helped van hell with some of his um let's say experiments with magic oh but yeah again, that's actually worth oh, okay yeah really do you want to dive onto that one yeah, okay very, do that one <laughs> super fucking brief so the black plague happened right the black plague. yeah David so we're the talking about the, the 11th century now yeah, a ton oh, of people 10, in the 12, Empire... 12, 12. Yeah, 12, yeah. Uh, a lot of people in the Empire die. According to some sources, like 9 out of 10 people die. It's a fucking mess. The Skaven are enslaving people. They're coming up. They're taking over the world. It's bad. Vlad puts a stop to this. There is... You cannot argue it any other way. Canonically, Vlad saves the Empire, and maybe even the world, from the Skaven, which is uh, pretty notable, because normally the Skaven are stopping the undead. Yep. And it's because he goes into Sylvania to fight the Skaven and he discovers Van Hal, uh, who's Frederick Van Hal at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on the story, he's either a priest of Moore or he's a minor noble. It just depends on which book you or read. Or both. Or yeah, or both. And yeah. uh, Vashanesh sees potential in him and basically guides him to uh, knowledge on necromancy and teaches him while hiding his true identity. He doesn't reveal himself as a vampire. But he mm -hmm. teaches him enough about necromancy that Van Hal gets going, becomes obsessed with it. And now that Vashanesh is Vlad, realizes that he's like, that boulder has started to roll. He backs off. He's done his part. He'll allow it to resolve. And Van Hal stops the Skaven. Like, I, I don't care how you look at it. Canonically, the Empire would have been completely fucked if the undead did not get involved. And Van Hal yeah. is a key part of that story. So, um, I, I, I brought that up for that very reason, but it also had a long-term effect on Sylvania. Sylvania and its legacy of this point. Now, for those of you who don't know Sylvania very well, it's actually the um, site of a very old tribe called the Fenones, um, which were not part of the tribes of Sigma. Um, and they are effectively a different people, a province held within the land of Stirland. Um, and it, they have always had a very different cast to the other people around them. And the influence of dark magic over time, particularly since the time of the Great Plagues, had changed Sylvania's general character. Um, and for whatever reason, Vlad decides to come here. And now it could be because he feels responsible for the dark magic that has already begun to change the place and he feels he needs to arrive. It could be something that Manfred said. It could be simply because he heard tale of whatever it was that was going down in good old Sylvania. What we can say for certain is at this point, not Waldenhof, but Drakenhof. So we're looking at, in terms of time, somewhere in oh, just before the Dark Ages begins. Mm. Um, so uh, he arrives, and he arrives at the court of Drak in Drakenhof, where the good old mad Count is, Otto, Otto von Drak. Yes, Count Otto von Drak himself, the mad Count, um, is on his deathbed, ranting and raving. 
doing all manner of crazy stuff, having done crazy stuff for some time. Now, don't well, think of him like an elector count. He's not an elector count. Let's get that nice and clear. Mm -hmm. um, we're at a point where the empire itself is already fractured. Sylvania is effectively self-ruling from this point. And Voldenoff had been its capital and will again later become its capital. It's in the north of Sylvania and um, where it is. But at the moment, right in the very heart of it, on a big, huge spur of rock, at the end of this spur of rock, an enormous castle where good old Drakenhof is. And the good old mad count rules from there. And he has a very beautiful daughter. Now, this is where I'm going to add drop a little thing, then let good old Sotek move on to the bit that he's clearly excited by. It. I love this bit, so I'm happy to pass off. But I'm going to say one thing that I really think should have happened, because it completely makes sense for vampire lore. She is the spit of Neferata. Mm. She is the spit of Neferata. Because he has not seen her for years. The woman who has collapsed. And he sees a woman. And she is extraordinarily intelligent. The one thing that's made clear about her is that she does not conform to standard practice. She's into falconry. She's into fencing. She's into fighting in a way that women at this particular point are not deemed to be <clears throat> supposed She's to be doing. Proper. What? Um, she was not like everybody else. And she's marked inside her lovely background as being incredibly clever. And the only thing that we really need to tip this scale is for her to be just like my love from days past. And he looks at her and he falls in love. But before we get onto that, ping, 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 ping. Yeah, and one thing to note is that, so the reason, in uh, my theory, because it different books will disagree on what Vlad came here for originally, is that there is a disturbing, genuinely disturbing amount of warp stone directly underneath Castle Drakenhof uh, because of like ancient warp stone meteors. In fact, during the time of Van Hal, there's a big warp stone meteor shower that impacts Sylvania, destroys it, because Sylvania used to be the breadbasket of the Empire, or part of the breadbasket. It used to be a beautiful place. Um, but it gets fucked because of all that dark magic and Van Howe like built his his fortress, which draws it's like kind of like a mini version of the Black Period of the Gash, so it draws in even more dark magic. Um, but there's warp stone all over the place, and Vlad has a goal. He is making his move. Granted, it's a very long term goal, but his goal is to use his position that he's about to take with uh, Otto von Drac for power. So that he can eventually take over the. Empire. I'm going to disagree to this point heavily. Okay, cool. But I'm, I'll set up my <laughs> reason story and then we'll get Andy's. So, uh, <laughs> but in order to do what he wants to do, he needs copious amounts of warp stone, and he knows where to find it because he's been here before, well, way back during the Black Plague era. Because this is a while after that. Um, so he shows up, and uh, there, it's a hilarious. The way it's described is actually genuinely hilarious. Of it's like this horrible dark stormy night. Otto von Drac is on his deathbed. He's raving. He's mad and furious, talking about like because he knows his brother is going to inherit, and he hates his brother. Fucking hates his brother. Who, granted, is a brutal thing, a brutal individual. But Otto is not a good man. Otto was a drunk and an asshole, and he tortured his own people, and he was a dick. Um, and he's he would very much had like the whole impaling people thing. He was ridiculous. So, but he has this lovely daughter who he genuinely loves in his own mad way. And he kind of raves a bit of like, oh, if only my daughter had been a son, I wouldn't be having this problem. Um, and he's he's just ridiculous. And there's this very iconic scene where he's dying in his bed. It's storming outside. And as it's storming, he says, I would, uh, I would, <laughs> I would marry my daughter to the worst demon in all the hells just yep. <laughs> to stop my brother from inheriting. And the second he says that, the door bursts open and there's Vlad. <laughs> so in my version of it, all of that, yes. But he has at this point no interest at all in trying to build uh, a great empire. I am going to argue that that comes from his wife-to-be. Mm -hmm. because we are about to find out exactly who she is and she is in a place that is indeed dark this place is dark and vladimir i am going to argue instead is still on his wanderings he's posing as a foreign noble going from place to place and he sees her it's as simple as that and he makes an enormous mistake 
He oh, makes a really big yeah, mistake. Yeah, we'll get we'll get into so because anyway. because he he does indeed storm through that door and save her. Yeah, so Vlad shows up and Otto <laughs> the hilarious thing is when he shows up and you like you get the the strings, you know, because it's, you know, thunder and lightning as he shows up. It's the world is almost clearly reacting to Otto and being like, "Here's what you wish for." And there's a hilarious note where Otto actually pauses because he realizes he got what he wished for. And he goes, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> no better than my brother. So yeah. a, a priest of Sigmar is summoned. Yeah, The marriage is done because we have to go fast here. Yeah. And they are married. Yep, And, and Vlad... Isabella doesn't like him. Yep, And Vlad's first act as the new Count of Sylvania is he turns to Otto's brother. Otto dies in bed. He dies immediately after the wedding. Uh, which happened within about five minutes. <laughs> it was rushed. Uh, Vlad turns to his brother, who is protesting, grabs him, and throws him out the tower window. Yeah. Problem it's solved. also worth noting that um, in most of the standard readings of this, uh, Vladimir is probably responsible for the old man dying in the first place, um, in yeah. that he has been bleeding him for some time. And I think that that speaks very much for this whole thing being orchestrated by Vlad, regardless of which, pref which version of the, the story you prefer. I much prefer the more romantic version because I think it speaks to our vampiric Heathcliff in a way that is not spoken to like in it. almost any other I way. I do like it. Um, and but that's again 100% a personal reading, that is not what the background says. Um, and we have ourselves Vladimir insinuating and inveigling his way directly into um power in Sylvania, regardless of which reading you go for, he takes over Sylvania. And this is where we get our first opportunity to see what his character is like. Is he a vampire? Yes, is he ruthless? Yeah, actually, um, there are various people that are going to stand against his rule, including Sigmarites, are pushed aside. But what he also does is he brings stability immediately. Yeah, Sylvania, Sylvania suddenly comes out good. Yeah, the people of Sylvania love Vlad very quickly. Because to them, like a new ruler taking over, yeah, whatever. Someone got murdered, yeah, whatever. That, yep. yeah, that happens. Yeah. Um, Isabella, like Andy said, doesn't like him at first. She avoids him. She's spiteful towards him. She just sees him as some asshole brigand that basically came in and stole power and is using her, and she's not about it, which hilariously, if anything, is just making Vlad love her even more because of this extreme streak of independence, and she's using very clever ways to kind of knife at him that she's like, I don't, you don't, I don't know you. You showed up and married me and, like, whatever. And What's interesting is this is a Vlad. I agree a hundred percent with Andy that Vlad loved Isabella the second he saw her. Like yep. it's very evident, but Isabella doesn't, and he's trying to earn her love while also securing his power to the point where, like, the priest of Sigmar mysteriously leaves and nobody ever sees him again. And all of the priests across Sylvania start to vanish, even though things are getting better for the people mm. of Sylvania. Bandits so start vanishing, roads are becoming safer. And I'll now support Sotek. Um, and I'll say that regardless of what his original plan was when he arrived in Sylvania, upon seeing her, upon seeing the situation they were in, upon, I would also suggest, realizing that he is vaguely responsible for the situation that Sylvania is in anyway because of what he did with Van Hill back in the past. He goes, now I need to make a difference. And what does this mean? Let's just very quickly state what the position of the Empire is at the moment. It's completely broken. The empire has shattered. It's been in an age of three emperors for several centuries, and they themselves have begun to completely collapse. In 1979, good old Empress Magritte is declared, it all breaks. This is the old world um, gone completely mad. Everything is broken. This is the period that it's be called the Dark Ages. And it's going to be called the Dark Ages because of much of what Vlad is about to do. But that's by the by. This is a broken period for the Empire. And he can see it completely fractured and broken. And the, the bloodlines of vampires are also to a degree responsible for this. He has a deep well of responsibility. And I'm going to suggest that Isabella is the one that changes everything here. He moves from being someone passing through to someone stopping and just stopping and going now, no, no, now. And when he realizes what he's got to do and he's got, he's putting down roots effectively, he immediately does what he does, which is he kingdom builds. He can't help himself. He's extraordinary at it. He's a king. He knows how to do well, this And stuff. Isabella wants it. Like yeah. the moment 
the moment they fall in love unfortunately it's one of those stories that i would sell my soul to have a really good author who understands romance write a really good romance novel about early vlad and isabella because yeah. to i it's worth taking a, just a minute to focus on their romance and then we can kind of focus on vlad in the kind of typical warhammer fashion of building up sylvania and everything that's going to happen with mordheim and all that other shit Mm -hmm. When Vlad and Isabella are having this kind of intricate dance of romance because Isabella is resisting at first and Vlad is trying to, like, she understands that Vlad is attractive, but she also, she like Andy said, she's very, <laughs> she's very. I'm going to argue that she isn't. Really? I'm well, going to argue. I'm going to argue say... that she will fall in love after. Um, after... She'll fall in love when Vlad does what she wants. When oh. Vlad becomes the Vlad that she needs, because she wants to conquer, she is in her heart, um, uh, pretty much a, a drac. And yeah, the she's drac, a drac. Yeah. she's a drac, and the dracs are fundamentally kind of broken anyway. She may be this great, marvelous beauty, um, but she has got pure ambition driven right through her. When she realizes what Vlad is, the first thing she does is, "I want to be that. Me, make me that." I want to be that. And he, to begin with, says no. And there yeah. is a period where there's like, I know what this means. You will be caught up with the curses and all this. Ah! And he's really unsure. But eventually he gives in. And it's clear why he gives in. He's absolutely besotted with her. And I would argue that love is ultimately his downfall. And as we progress through the various steps that happen, she completely falls for him because he ultimately does everything she wants that's a yeah that's a very fair way to look at it i think of uh, one of the things that's important about isabella is that she's pretty rejectful of vad uh, most of her mortal life because they're they're married with her being immortal for years like mm -hmm. it's a good like 10 15 years a really long time yeah uh where she maintain like she doesn't become elderly uh because of the thing about vlad is that like andy said fascinatingly he refuses to give her the blood kiss because he understands very well by this point the curse of vampirism and that although he's capable of resisting it and he's probably likely been seeing it in Manfred and his some of his other direct descendants, it will affect them. And someone as passionate as Isabella, someone who has that raw need for ambition and power, that's a dangerous person to give the blood kiss, especially with mm -hmm. the Von Karstein bloodline. Because by this point, he realizes that the curse of the Von Karsteins is that they are ambitious. They're him. Yeah. And he has learned to curb it because he sees the dangers of what he is. He has survived the worst of all of it. So it's not so much that Vlad changes, it's that Vlad becomes what he always could have been and wasn't. Isabella brings out arguably the worst in him. The absolute worst in him because we see a character go from basically one version of Vlad walloping over to another in a space of just a few years. He goes from someone who is, you know, a kingdom builder into an absolute overlord. And you could argue that this happens the moment that she persuades him after she has been turned to start spreading vampirism all the way through. Sylvania. And this is marked in the background in a couple of places where it says that she was his closest advisor. She was the one who pushed him over towards doing everything. She was everything to him. And he is sitting there with his great hopes of binding everything together. And she's going, we'll do it. We'll do it. But the way that she wants it done is not necessarily the way that Vashinesh would have done it. But Vlad himself is now caught up in the whole thing. He is, he's in love. And he is going to make a few errors here. And there's someone watching on that I'm going to argue didn't so much betray Vashinesh. Well, betray Vlad. Betray Vashinesh has betrayed Vlad. Yeah. And the, okay. So the last thing I want to wrap up with, just for those curious about how Isabella gets turned, of that they have this back and forth story. They're married for many years. Vlad is deeply mm -hmm. in love. If anything, only falls more and more in love. Yep. And Isabella. It, we don't know exactly when it, she falls in, back in love with him, but she definitely respects him and their relationship continues to deepen and deepen and deepen mm -hmm. until she gets really sick. Um, she catches, and it's not like there's not a plot. She gets genuinely ill with a horrible disease. Um, probably because Sylvania has got a lot of problems. Um, there's warp stone everywhere and dark magic everywhere, which is not good for human life. But eventually she gets 
deeply sick. Who knows? May, though right. I will say it could be interesting if maybe there was someone who did make her sick, but it wasn't Vlad. It was another rival uh, who intent. Uh, I think, it, yeah, I think it's um, one of two sources. Manfred tried to kill her. Yeah. Option number one, um, because Manfred realized how much of a dark influence that she was upon Vlad. That's the obvious one. The less obvious one is chaos, Nurgle. Um, and the reason I call this one out as ridiculous it may be is because of what happens in the end times. If you want to build the proper story of the end times and make it make sense, you seed it now, all the way back now. This mm. corruption of um, uh, she is corrupt. She is literally corrupt. And the corruption of chaos is seeding its way through her to bring down the nobility of Vashanesh. Nurgle, despair, turning it into something else feeding on Vashanesh's despair at what the world is becoming. This is Nurgle's playground. And for those of you who don't like the end times, you can ignore the fact that she falls to Nurgle. The seed should be here. Yeah, This is when it begins. There's also, uh, if you're someone that really likes your love triangles and make things super messy, could also have been Neferata um, uh, through Ooh. an agent. Um, of like, <laughs> Neferata realizes that Vashanesh is alive and he's back. And he's married another woman who he's deeply in love with. Um, I think of all of them, if I was writing it before I do the like end the times, Nurgle angle though, I yeah, really before like the end, Nurgle angle. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, before the end times came, I would have made it Manfred, and I would have had Manfred try to seed it as Neferata should it be discovered, because Manfred has been always, he's basically you know his dad, and dad's going bad. Look what yeah, dad's doing. Also, there Everything is a... dad said he was kind of isn't happening anymore. There is a very deep writing as well that Manfred gets deeply jealous of um, of Isabella essentially replacing him, where yeah. he very clearly says, Vlad loved me the longest, but I will admit he loved Isabella the most. Like, yeah, there, is, and I, there is betrayal there. I, I honestly think as well that they were probably lovers. Um, and it's yeah, an that, easy thing for us, particularly given that this was written in a period of Games Workshop where that sort of thing is icky and would not be written about. Yeah, but a little yeah. bit like the original vampire, um, vampire Lestat and the various vampire chronicles over there, they moved from looking at those books and going, oh my goodness, they were just lovers, weren't they? And when they did the new series, by <laughs> the were gods, roommates? weren't they lovers? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're saying, wait, wait, they were just rumors. Right? Two men can't do that. They're not even men. They're bloody vampires. Get over yourself. Um, and I think that's almost certainly the case. Now, I'm not saying they're exclusive lovers or anything like that at all. It's something far deeper and abiding in terms of their love. And she is toxic, properly. Toxic. This is also a very interesting version as well that Isabella made herself sick. Yeah, I like that one too. Um, and I think that that is ultimately the story I would go for. As I was about to say, post the end times, post the end times, I would have her being fall to chaos and chaos approaching her and her choosing to get sick to effectively force his hand and bring her into what she wanted, um, seeding the first seeds of corruption to Nurgle into her to make sure that we can then build an end time story that actually makes sense because the story of Ooh, her corruption There's a lot of fun, spicy ways to resolve stupid. that mystery, which is fun. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's like, super fun. She gets yeah. super sick and she's dying. Like, nobody can help her. The priests can't help her. The Shalians can't help her. The doctors can't help her. And Vlad, and the whole time she's going, you can save me, make me a mm -hmm. vampire. You can save me. And Vlad keeps saying, no, 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 no. And finally, he realizes that whatever the sickness is, which I think reinforces Andy's point, that it's not a mundane illness because nobody can stop it. They have magic and they can't stop it. Uh, he finally tells everyone to leave. He tells all the priests to get out, all the doctors to get out, and he says he'll tend to her himself. And then a few days later, she reappears looking healthy again, if a little pale, because he finally he could not bear losing her and having to deal with existence knowing he will never see her again yeah absolutely and i think this is arguably the act that can that seals his fate um because post this he changes oh yeah um sylvania changes everything changes it's almost like he's taken that step too far now there's various ways you could interpret this but again i would prefer if we were looking at this in terms of trying to make the best story for Warhammer and what eventually becomes with the travesty that is the end times, if we want to set that up properly, then we clearly set it up. Um, the influence of Nurgle is now being felt and the campaign to come and the dissolution of everything that Vashnesh was and what 
has now become Vlad's character because Vlad's character becomes angry, really angry. His temper peaks all the time. He pretty much sires his way across all the noble bloodlines of Sylvania. They start falling ill and then coming back again going, hello, actually, no, I'm fine. Whoa, oh, oh. Do yeah, the, not worry about this. this oh, almost oh, oh. the second he turns Isabella, like the immediately following years, likely, like Andy says, because of her influence, he dominates Sylvania. He turned mm -hmm. everybody into a van. Every single noble in Sylvania becomes a vampire and anyone who either dies because they're not, they don't have the constitution to survive the blood kiss or they're somehow a threat, whether they be priests or witch hunters, all those people mysteriously disappear. Disappear or get ill. Um, and in fact, it gets slightly worse because as more time is taken out in 1999 and Vlad sends off agents to start picking up all the weird stone and the warp stone to go all the way up there. Yeah, he like then, not long after this, more time. Summons, yeah. summons an enormous swathe of the remaining nobles around all that area summons them into his castle, closes it up, and murders them all. L literally all of them. And Isabella's sitting there, licking her lips, loving it all, because they're finally taking control. I cannot express the massive character change that we have from one to the other. It's one of the reasons why many writers prefer to say, I don't think it's Vashanesh. Vashanesh was this, and this is this. But just look at it. He's in love, and he's lost it. And if we bring in that touch from the end times, that Nurgle influence, not only has he lost it, he's lost it for a reason. They have been corrupted. And that, I think, gives you all the answers you need for the enormous campaign that is about to come and is ultimately going to end in the death of Vlad completely. And sadly, who causes it? But when I say sadly, when you actually think of that as a potential, it suddenly all makes sense. Yep, uh, but we're not quite there yet. Um, We're close. Like, like Andy said, uh, Vlad at this point is very different. Like when he finally settles, and if you're looking at it from a Nurgle point, stagnates, um, his vampire corruption finally gets him, mm -hmm. where he becomes an angry motherfucker. Like Vlad is genuinely terrifying because his rages are very sudden, they're very abrupt. He'll just lose himself and literally just rip a vampire in half. Uh, and Isabella loves it. Oh, yeah. She's eating it up. Get that. Okay. Get her character and what she's like. She loves it. Vlad is becoming everything that she loves. Power incarnate. Her father before her was like this. Admit it, I'm not saying that she's fallen in love with she's her got dad. <laughs> okay. But I think it's fair to say she has got some form of daddy issues going on here. Um, And Vladimir represents this. And she absolutely adores him because she's become he's become everything that she thinks is power that she thinks is right and whether there's a chaos influence or not here we now have ourselves a vampire power couple that are completely head over heels in love with each other and he as he loses himself into this new version of himself finds that perhaps there is something let's, let's put it in heavy quotations here good to be hub of this because their advances are swift and they are quite decisive yeah, so he basically conquers all of Sylvania, kicks everybody out that's potentially even remotely a threat, oh, uh, and he becomes out. Because And it's worth noting, the people of Sylvania who are very downtrodden, they don't notice a lot of things at first, because at, at first, Vlad and Isabella are relatively careful, where they will pretend to die and then like hand over the throne to their descendant, mm -hmm. who just happens to look a lot like them. And for the people of Sylvania, you know, they don't see their rulers that much. They're peasants out in the fields, and the fields of Sylvania are hard to tend as it is. So they got their own problems. Nobody cares. You know, they're they're busy dealing with their own crap. And the Empire is in civil war. So nobody's paying attention to what's going on down in little Podunk Sylvania, which is kind of a worthless land to them, anyways. And Vlad is consolidating power and he's building and building and building. And in his desire for power, which is being spurred on by his wife, he and he also starts to indulge in vampirism, almost like because of Isabella, he's starting to see the good side of what Lamia was like. Oh, yeah. you know, it is kind of fun when I don't restrain myself. It is kind of fun when I feed every night or if someone pisses me off, I smash their head into a million pieces or we throw banquets where we're literally feasting on our enemies. And Isabella, like Isabella is one of the most terrifying, bloodthirsty fucking vampires in the setting. She's really, like, when you look at her, you're like, oh, she's so pretty, and she's just hanging on Vlad's arm. She's fucking scary. 
Now, I'd argue that um, you could easily make a clear case that uh, Isabella is the one that wants to be empress. He he does want to be emperor, but not like this. That is not what he planned or wanted. But she really does. And she is a power-hungry person. And everything that has been pushed forward in her almost Lady Macbeth-esque type fashion um, it corrupts Vlad into the Vlad that he becomes. And he's doing it more for her rather than because that's him. But it becomes I... him because at its heart... He's got dark magic running yeah. through him. Per and I would argue that Isabella may be intentionally because she is this level of smart. Like she's not stupid. Yeah. She's very conniving and clever and loves her husband. You have to remember, she genuinely loves him. And I think from her perspective, she thinks she's doing the right thing. But if mm -hmm. you keep in mind her upbringing, that she's a drac and all of these other mm -hmm. features, mm -hmm. her version of the right thing is twisted. And she, loving Vlad, takes in his dream of raising humanity up, uniting humanity, defeating chaos, and she puts her spin on it, which is... They want the same thing. Yeah, my love, in order to protect humanity, we must dominate humanity. Yeah. If if humanity is consolidated under one immortal undead emperor, we could defeat chaos. And Vlad goes, my love, you're right. Yeah. Um, and And over the course of the years that they're together, he... Now, we would see it as devolves, but she would see it as evolves, as he eventually becomes the person that he kind of always has been behind the scenes. The uh, uh, vampire that we come to know and love as the worst excesses of our Dracula myth, he has now become it. Um, and come, what, 2010, uh, 20, that's when the vampire wars actually start. Yep. When Vlad makes his move to move from Sylvania out into the Empire and starts his attempts to conquer all of it. And because they're... at this moment, the Empire's fractured and broken, and he fully intends to bring peace to all of it. Yeah, and there are two little things to talk about before we get to the start of the Vampire Wars. Uh, the first is that, A, he's gathered copious amounts of Warpstone. Yes, like, he has. He's gathered so much Warpstone, it is insane to think about. Uh, actually, three things. B, or number two... He's been inventing new forms of undead. The Black Coach, Vlad made them. He arrived in one, actually, as I recall. Um, yeah. The very first time that he arrives, um, he has arrived in it. Um, although it's not said that it's a proper Black Coach at this point. But yeah, he definitely I, I, arrived I, I, in what very much looked like one. Yeah, I think it, maybe either inspired by that or he, or as he hmm. devolved slash evolved, maybe he devolved slash evolved the concept of the Black Coach. That seems quite likely to me. Uh, and then the third thing is all the corpse cards in existence, Vlad made them. They are created during this period. And what I particularly love as well is that he starts off his campaign doing something that Nagash failed to do. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. And one other thing is he created Conrad. And the yeah. creation of Conrad mm -hmm. bears a mention. It's also worth noting, though, that Conrad may not have been created quite as um, some say or when he said, given that the second Vampire Chronicle novel was meant to be the reveal that Skellen was Conrad. There's that. Okay. If you read the Which Vampire is worth knowing. So do go read the Vampire Chronicles if you want to go Vampire more into that. Trilogy, it yeah. is an interesting. That never happened because Black Library, right at the last moment, next it because they weren't sure if the studio would like it. But very recently, Steve Savile, who's great, he's a great guy. He's one of my mates. Um, Steve Savile mm -hmm. had a nice little discussion over on Twitter about exactly that and how Skellen was originally planned to be Conrad. Um, so uh, Conrad was his second name. His name was like Skell something is Conrad or whatever. Um, but that's definitely worth it. John, is it John Skellen? Is that his name? I can't remember. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's been a wee while since I read that. But, but yeah, John Conrad Skellen. And he he was going to be Conrad. And Conrad is, by the gods, he makes Vlad look like a happy guy. And the thing about Conrad that's really important to show how far Vlad has fallen in a sense is that Vlad knew Conrad would not be a good vampire that it, he was already a fucking nightmare as a human. And there is a quote in the uh, the various army books that basically says that Vlad turns Conrad for fun. Like he essentially turns him because he wants to see what would happen because he's that kind of degenerate in a sense. Yeah, that got, that was planned to be overwritten and that's why it wasn't overwritten. Ah, I see. Yep. Yeah. So the, the, yeah, the plan was to try and make it feel more real. 
Um, and not just, ha, 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 I'm a cackling bad guy. Ha, ha, I have created a cackling worse bad guy, punt. Um, and they instead <laughs> tried to create something that made a little bit more sense. But because it contradicted what had already been written in the army list, they went, let's not do it. Ah, I kind of wish they had. Because, like, I like that story, but it feels like it could have been a slight bit more grounded and still fun. Um, yeah, anyway, totally. So Particularly yeah, given what we know of Vashnish. Yeah, go check that. the Vampire Wars. Like, there's quite a lot in that. All right, so, um, so Vampire Wars. Uh, yeah, so given the time, um, is it worth going through all the detail of this, or should we just basically summarize it? Uh, I'll give a summary, and if you want to add bits, you can add bits. Perfect. Sounds because a lot me. of y'all are already going to know the Vampire Wars, and yeah. we're, for these streams, I think it's far more fascinating to talk about the characters and the things mm -hmm. that you may not know about them and trying to really pry open who they are, because you can just yeah. look up the wiki on the Vampire Wars, and it's going to be basically accurate. Yep. Um, so basically what happens is the first thing is we have the big night of the dead, which is that Vlad walks out on the top tower <laughs> of, uh, Castle Drakenfels and he unleashes a hell of a ritual. It's a slightly, well, notably smaller version of Nagash's ritual, but he doesn't get killed in the middle of it. And he awakens all of the dead of Sylvania. Right. So I'm going to call something his, his level three, uh, vampirism in good old warhammer is bullshit if he pulls off that spell that ritual he's a level four wizard by vampire um yeah, by... To, be, to be fair he did have a fuck ton of warp stone and also one of the actual books of nagash like not a fake not a copy all true but still yeah. level four not level three just, yeah, it just was, saying yeah i always feel like they tried to they wanted to make manfred like noticeably yeah, bigger. So they they nicked Vlad a little bit to try and make that true. But no, I Vlad think is like a really I I agree answer. completely. The biggest issue was the scaling that they had. Yeah, they should um, just be man for level five and just call. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They they should have done. They should have done the the, the classic. He's just one up. Um, yeah. but yes, uh, just worth calling that one out. Yeah. Anyway, so he resurrects continue. All, all the dead of Sylvania, and now he's out. He declares war on the world, and all of the undead that have been lurking around Sylvania, where the pe the peasants have been looking, and they occasionally catch uh, a view of like a dire wolf in the forest or whatever that were protecting them, um, making sure nobody left or anything. But he outs himself, and to be fair, he, despite the fact he was a pretty brutal ruler, the people of Sylvania still viewed him as better than what was before that. So when he outs himself and the undead come out, the people of Sylvania are a little like ooh at first, but they follow him. Yeah. So just to make that clear, um, if you were playing a proper Sylvanian army with the electric counts, they should have humans everywhere. Yeah. Under Vlad. It, yeah. Not really Under Vlad. the case with his decision. Later! That's yeah. a bit different. But at this point, definitely. Yeah. So uh, Vlad reveals himself to the world and he goes out on the big conquest where all the things you famously know and epic happen where you know he goes out on one battlefield he gets his head shot off by a cannon they're like yeah we killed him and then by the end of the battle that was a bergen happen actually yeah probably and <laughs> by the end of the battle he's ripping the cannon crew apart then he gets yeah. murdered by the uh the lead grandmaster of the knights of the white wolf who bodily rips him apart which like good god that man must have been huge <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> um, oh. But unfortunately for him, uh, I think uh, two weeks later, he's found drained completely hanging from the, uh, I believe it's the, the, like the outside part of the temple of Ulrich um, in Middenheim. Like Vlad went into the city, tracked him down, murdered him, drained every drop of blood from his body and left him as a warning hanging from the temple, which like, damn. <laughs> yeah. 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 Totally. Cut a long story short. He does go to war and he wins a lot um and this is um an interesting part of the story because we get a little bit of a problem um where we get somebody who wrote the story who didn't actually understand the true nature of what the empire was going through at the time because half of the time when you work your way through the stories it feels like the empire is just the normal empire with an emperor sitting at the center of it the grand theogenist in support with a capital in altdorf it's just not the case of this era the empire has collapsed there are multiple capitals of multiple groups of multiple oh, 
people who all consider themselves important. Middenheim was completely separate from Talapheim, which is completely separate from Altdorf, which was working with Marienburg and Nuln to agree. Nuln is the biggest city inside mainland um, uh, the Empire, not Altdorf. Altdorf is actually quite small at this point in comparison yeah, to really? what it will be later. Um, and Marienburg is the biggest, most important city in the entirety of the Empire in terms of its overall strength, which is why Empress Magritte in 19 79 I see tried to claim she was empress um much to the discon well many did not like this the empire collapsed because of it um so cut a long story short make aware that we have that version of the empire but we also have the second version that says he rollicks around kicking in armies here and there kills an electric count there stabs that guy runs that person through and then eventually after having had a really big scrap up in Middenheim decides to abandon Middenheim so Middenheim can claim it's never fallen, move all the way down to the south, and then, for reasons that are absolutely uncertain, decide to take out Altdorf. And that Altdorf suddenly became the centre of everything that matters. Now, you could bring up a good reason, for example, the cult of Sigmar and taking out its heart. It's a good way to carve out one heart of the Empire. But remember, up in the north, they don't even really do the Sigmar thing. At this point, Ulrich is far more important. And at this point, Ottilia over... Ottilia, who had her army completely minced, by the way, by... Uh, oh, yeah. by uh, absolutely, absolutely destroyed. Ottilia up in Talapheim has banned Sigmarism for centuries. It's just... There has been no Sigmarism in Talapheim land. So even using that as an excuse is relatively weak. But nevertheless, <laughs> Vlad eventually arrives at Altdorf. And when I yeah, say I think... he's got a big host... Yeah, I think if anything, they they, and you can tell it's because the author was thinking of modern empire. It's the capital, yeah, yeah it's totally the, capital, the biggest city there is. Uh, when that was not the case a couple hundred years ago, um, yeah, well, actually, 500. More than a couple, yeah, uh, yeah. And it, uh, it's also worth noting that if you wanted to make it like an actual good reason, you could, I would lean much more heavily on the fact that Nagash, when he got his ass kicked by Sigmar, cursed all vampires in relates to Sigmar, um, to be like weak against Sigmar for abandoning him. So it's what I go for going to deal with that would be a seeing that as a genuine threat, being like, I need to wipe out this cult. I would uh, suggest that something happened up in Middenheim when he was besieging Middenheim, a city that would not be hard to besiege. You might go, Well, wait a minute, Middenheim's in a giant rock. Well, exactly. How are they gonna get any food to it? Yeah, it's it's, you, it's gonna fall after a few months. <laughs> okay, he can just wait with all of his army asleep during the day because they're all dead and then they wake up. Because Vlad's basically going from place to place saying, Join me. Or join me in death. Oh yeah, that's um, such a good line. It, that yeah, is his totally. iconic line. Join his yeah. iconic. Join me serve, or uh, serve, serve me, me in death. Life. Yeah, yeah. Join or, me in life or serve me in and serve me in and, death. Yeah. And a lot decided to serve him because yeah, who wouldn't? Many, but, yeah, a lot of yeah. cities surrender. Yeah, quite. Um, and he is good to his word for all the vampires are off by this point because there's so many of them. Many of them are cruel beyond anyone's expectation. The the blood courts that we will know for the Karsteins later have already begun to rise. Many of the worst examples of them are leading armies across the empire and kicking ass and chewing gum. And they don't do that whole serve or don't serve. They just come in rampaging, doing whatever they want. But I would suggest something happens in Middenheim that makes him realize he needs to take out the cult of Sigmar. And he withdraws from that siege and comes back to Altdorf, because we need a good reason for yeah. him to do that. The only other strong motivator he ever has is Isabella. So Isabella says something, or, and this is where I'm now going to bring out what I would do, it's Manfred. Yep. So this is where we Manfred to... does it, because Manfred realizes that Vlad is freaking mental. Yeah. Manfred, who is Vlad's, I, like Andy said, very potentially former lover, um, yeah. also in many ways, kind of a son figure, um, is looking at Vlad and has been with Vlad for millennia, uh, is looking at Vlad and realizing he, uh -uh. this is not, this is not Vlad. This is a monster. Like how we talked about where Vlad saw Neferata. This is now happening to Manfred. Mm -hmm. And well, Manfred. Vlad. Yeah, oh, yeah, I see what you're no, saying. No, yeah, no, yeah, Manfred. Yeah, yeah, Manfred. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Manfred is, I agree 100% with Andy. This is where Manfred goes. I, Vlad needs to die. Like this, he is, he is such a threat to everything. And he is such an abomination. Like if, if I was able to be with him as he truly was, and he were to look at what he has become, he would tell me that thing must die. 
And so Manfred puts into plan a way to kill Vlad, which is hard. Like, even for Manfred, really fucking hard. He can't just attack him. That's not going to work. Vlad would beat his shit in. Mm -hmm. So he comes up with a scheme, which is to lure Vlad to a place where there is potentially uh, a cult who has a better chance than anybody at killing him. Yep. And so Manfred, when the great siege of Altdorf begins, and this is a big one, so big that it will change the, the heraldry of Altdorf forever, where they will have a cowled skeleton um, looming over their heraldry uh, because of the great success that they are about to incur, a great success that all lies at the hands of Manfred von Karstein. When the great army besieges Altdorf, now, I don't know what you know about Altdorf, but Altdorf is on the confluence of two great rivers that lead out with the Reich at the, the far end. At this point, Altdorf was quite ready. It had already flooded everything around the city with a great bank of water to try and act as an enormous moat. But Altdorf itself is in the center of a great marsh, but... Uh, around between the marsh and the city, there's great open plains and many battles have been fought there. And when Vlad arrived, every single last thing that ever died was summoned up out of the marshes and the plains around the city. And they bolstered an already enormous army, a truly huge undead and not entirely undead army. And this encamped out in such a fashion that it was quite clear who was going to win. There, there's not any doubt. Don't think here. There, ah, there's, there's, um, there's a good quote uh, when Vlad shows up where he gives his iconic join me in life or serve me in death. And the 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 emperor, the, the Reichland emperor, uh, is fully ready to surrender. Like he is <laughs> on board to surrender immediately. And the Grand Theogenist is like, if you surrender, I will throw you off these fucking walls. <laughs> Don't you dare My surrender. Hell. <laughs> uh, super fun um, so uh, this is an enormous army that has patience because what they can do is basically stop they don't feed, they don't eat they can move tirelessly from place to place but during the day it's silent because the vast majority of this army is dead and the vampires sleep during the day so uh, anywhere that are sitting out in the walls just look out and they just see an endless open space of corpses, some of which are still animated, doing their little things because they don't need to sleep during the day, but the vast majority are just lying down dead because they are dead. They don't just sit there mulling around doing nothing. Their magic just sits there waiting for something to come. And that is something that Manfred is about to potentially get an advantage from because yeah, he decides to have a chat with someone. What's worth noting is that Manfred likely convinces Vlad that they shouldn't attack the city immediately because Vlad doesn't. He waits. He waits mm -hmm. for a response for his whole little speech. And mm -hmm. the emperor does not immediately say, oh, we won't surrender. He goes, can I He's think gonna... about it? And Vlad goes, yeah, all right, fine. Uh, I'll give you like, I think he gives him like three days or something. Um, mm -hmm. And once again, probably with Manfred's tempting. So the Grand Theogenist goes, okay, give me three days. I'm going to go pray for an answer. Great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So thoughts and prayers. Thank you, Grand Theogenist. So the Grand Theogenist goes all the way down into the depths of the Cathedral of Sigvar and he prays. He fasts, he refuses to eat or drink water. He is literally forcing himself to suffer to try and appeal to Sigmar to give him an answer. And if you're a big fan of the enemy within, it's not Sigmar that answers him, interestingly enough. It's no, another it is not. Uh now the Grand Theogenist <laughs> thinks it's Sigmar, but to be fair, he's also grossly dehydrated, starving, <laughs> and kind of out of his mind. And he hears a whispering and a voice tells him how to win. A voice tells him, you must get the greatest thief to ever live who you have in your city. Find the greatest thief and send him out to the uh, commander's tent. Find Vlad and take the ring from his finger. Do this and you will be delivered. And the Grand okay, Theodosius so goes, bet. Take a moment to consider what's just happened. This is the Grand Cathedral of Sigmar. In the Altdorf. holiest place in the world! <laughs> and Manfred is sitting in there whispering. He has snuck into the holiest site of Sigmar and that is a tale that has not really been properly examined. It has merely been explained as to what he did, not the how or the why. Super fascinating. Perhaps worth taking up in a Manfred stream. But that all said, Manfred slips through the truth, which is Vashanesh keeps coming back. Vlad keeps coming back because of his ring. And if you get rid of that ring, he is not coming back. 
Yep. So, uh, very famously, the thief. Uh, oh God. Uh, Yerick. Um, no. Nope. No. Nope. Starts with a J. I'm. Oh, I'm that's annoying. I'm, yeah. That's annoying I can't remember. I might we'll look it up. But, uh, there was indeed a master thief who very mysteriously, mm. once again, thinking a uh, Felix man. Thank you, Felix. Man. Felix man. That's it. Yeah. Not a J. Thanks, uh, so um, this is a really interesting thing that once again suggests Manfred may be responsible. Felix man was the greatest thief in the world, but he had been caught recently somehow, which is interesting to think about. He just so happened to get caught in Altdorf and just so happened to be arrested and not executed. And the, the Grand Theosh just goes, let him go. Tell him that if he goes and he steals this ring from Vlad, we will forgive every crime he's ever done. He's a free man and we'll even pay him. And he goes, all right, bet. I'm the greatest thief in the world. I can do this, even though I'm scared shitless. And what it does confirm is that Manfred ensures that he can get to that tent. So there's no doubt that Manfred oh, yeah, definitely outdated. does this. And that as he slips his way through the camp, Stepping between the corpses, trying to find the resting places <laughs> of these vampires. He's the best thief of all time, sneaking past <laughs> all these undead. Manfred, alive and quite willing to do whatever is required during the day. Get that, just to make sure you understand. He has not caused any particular hindrance by this. During the day, stops it all so that he can creep all the way through. And hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Take that ring. Bet Felix, being the chap he is, pop, 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 Can you somehow how does it. Fucking terrified he must have been sneaking into that vampire thing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, uh, like kudos to Felix. Like at, even though it was all set up for him, that still took some balls to like sneak through all those undead, oh, go totally. up to Vlad himself, touch him, pull the ring off, and run away. <laughs> like my <laughs> god. And when good old Vlad wakes up, he is. Freaking! Oh! The couples we talked about. This is the the apocalyptic one, and he goes mental and goes time to attack. Well, I think he may have done it with a slightly more vigor. Than oh, I'm sure know. he said it just like that. <laughs> just like, Excuse me, Wait, boys. No it's now. time to attack. <laughs> they stole my jewelry. And get them. Uh, so yeah. So there's a mass, and once again. This isn't Vashanesh. This is Vlad. Vashanesh would have paused. Vashanesh. Oh. <laughs> Lindsay thought I'd hurt myself because I was screaming in here. <laughs> he just came running in going. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so, Vashanesh. Sorry, everyone. Have, what's fascinating, once again, this is the Isabella influenced Vlad, not Vashanesh. Vashanesh would have paused. Vashanesh mm -hmm. would have gone. That's mighty convenient. That's mm -hmm. odd. How did because think about it, undead sentinels, they don't need to sleep, they don't need to eat, they don't get distracted. Undead mm -hmm. sentinels are the best in the world. There's no human alive without like sorcery who should have been able to sneak in there. He had sorcery, just not from another human. Manfred was just using his necromancy to make sure none of the undead could see him. And so, but Vlad doesn't think about this, he's too angry. So he mm -hmm. attacks Altdorf. It's a huge battle. Massive. Absolutely ridiculous. Vlad makes his way up onto the walls. He's fighting. Isabella's fighting. Everyone's fighting. And we get, to, to be completely fair to his credit, an incredible duel between the Grand Theogenist and Vlad, which you might kind of flare in the back of your mind, may remind you of another great epic duel that happened in Aegis Pass between uh Alcatazar the Conqueror and Vashanesh in a very similar set of circumstances. And the Grand Theogenes completely outclassed. Like mm -hmm. doesn't stand a chance in hell. But he is a Sigmarite through and through, and he's kind of insane <laughs> being, being a high priest. And he does something that Vashanesh probably genuinely did not expect, in that he was more than willing to die to stop Vlad. Which, like, hey, full kudos to that guy. He's a fucking hero. Because Manfred's plan, Manfred had a plan, but Manfred was gonna, like, you know what? If the humans get him, they get him. But I am making sure to leave myself removed enough that if they fail, he can't track it back to me. Because Manfred is nothing if not cautious. And so the Grand Theogenist is fighting Vlad, and Vlad, to, being Vlad, is probably toying with his food a little bit maybe not killing him as fast as he should, because this is the Grand Theogenist, one of the biggest annoyances in the world to him, someone who's supposed to be this 
antithetical Nagash empowered essentially counter to him. And it's a joke until suddenly this man with maybe genuine Sigmar inspired strength. Cause maybe Sigmar was listening to his prayers. Yeah, I think so. Uh, runs forward and tackles Vlad bodily picks him up. And the two of them go falling off of the walls of Altdorf plummeting hundreds of feet, screaming and snarling until they impale on the stakes that have been lined around the walls. And through sheer God given luck, the stake went straight through <laughs> Vlad's heart. And then the grand theogenist lands on top of him, driving him all the way down. And yeah. Vlad lets out a horrible shriek, the likes of which none of us can imagine. I'm sure with his mouth opening horrifically wide and he just disintegrates and falls apart into dust. And so passes Vlad von Karstein. That's him going. So <clears throat> for those of you who like your end time stuff, I'll drop a few extra sentences because that's all I'm going to dedicate it. Perhaps Sotek <laughs> would like to add some more to that, but that's all I'm going to add to it. Uh, yeah, he gets summoned back again by good old Vanfred. Oh, no. Um, Isabella, she's fallen to chaos. Oh, no. Nagash comes along. I'll help you out. Don't you worry. I can get Isabella back. Um, it all goes out. Needless to say, come the end times, um, Vlad is Vashanesh in terms of his overall character. He's an absolutely capable general. He's far more on point. Um, and he is utterly in love with Isabella. Um, I think it's fair to say that he's gained his mind back. He's got distance. He's got time to look at it all and go, this is the end that I want. Some of it is absolute bobbins. Um, the whole becoming Nick, um, the Mortark of um, the Gash and exactly why, and the betrayals that came before, there's a story there that needed to be told to make sense of it all that wasn't. Um, just simply saying, I'll give you Isabella is weak sauce. Um, and it needed a bit more there, particularly given how that all came well, so out I'll, in the end anyway. I'll, I'll insert just a little bit to just to say that. So Nagash brings Vlad back. Um, he like literally rips him out of Manfred. There's actually a scene where we get to see it. Manfred's like being suspended and having blood ripped out of him by Nagash and is screaming in agony as Nagash is like, shut up, I'm working. Oh, um, yeah, and uh, Nagash re reaches into wherever vampires are hanging out when they're dead, rebuilds Vlad, gives him back his ring and says, all right, I put you back together. I will blast you apart if you don't do what I say. Also, I'll give you back Isabella if you do as I say, which what Vlad does not know, which is actually very interesting, is that the reason Nagash didn't bring back Isabella, he wanted to, he couldn't find her. Mm-hmm. Which, uh, which of course, we end up learning that Nurgle is responsible uh, yeah, totally. because of end times shenanigans, uh, which I actually don't hate that story. Uh, no, I, I, I think there's a, a lot of really cool here, um, but, but, anyway, but sorry, it just I wasn't quite filled. Yeah, yeah so, I, yeah, I agree completely. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lovely little bit with my friend. I skipped that because it's so stupid. You might like it, but I think it's just stupid. Oh, I find the mental fun. image funny. Oh, I love the I, I actually love the idea of it, but it's stupid. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to bring up one there perhaps when we do an Isabella stream we can discuss exactly how she dies that's why we have our other streams I'll, um, I'll give you the very short oh, version oh, they, can just google it. they can just google it it's not yeah, hard like, okay, Isabella deserves enough. her own stream don't get me wrong Isabella deserves her own stream she really does because she's awesome but this is the moment where you have to remember they've been deeply in love for hundreds of years and by this point she is obsessively in love with him and despite the fact that she wants to, you know, we've talked about she wants power, she unfortunately has fallen for her own unintended trap, which is that she is now in the opposite position that Vlad was in when Vlad saved her from illness and did something he did not want to do, where she realizes that she is now facing eternity without him, and she realizes she can't do it. So she throws herself from the walls of Altdorf and is also impaled in the stakes below, and she dies. And with her death, the vampire army just fucking fractures. Because A, their power is no longer holding a lot of the undead up. And B, now you have all these vampire lords going, wait, boss is dead. We're all on the same team now, or the same level. And infighting just immediately breaks out. Yeah, so I think it's also really important to include that. It's one of the reasons I didn't actually like the Nurgle story um, uh, without it having um, the despair laid through all of it um she's dead and it would have been nice to have that explained more neatly but i think it is a beautiful end to their love story um i think that the fall of vlad 
um, from being Vashnesh to Vlad is perfect. And I, I really wish there had been that moment for her where it wasn't just, I can't carry on because I'll be without him. It's, this is my fault. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This really, is really my fault. Okay, suck. because the second you start diving into that side of it and the heart rate, this is when, out of all times, the true nature of her love comes through, just how much she's in love with him um, and just how much it has broken her. And I think that that makes it much more, uh, and also explains how you could have despair completely sink through her for an end times version. Um, the end times version was a great idea that was so poorly phrased and completely missing the great love story beyond a stereotype of love, like he will do anything to get her because she has been captured by bad guys. He will do, oh no, look at this. Oh, it was rubbish. Um, I really disliked it because it lacked heart, it lacked soul. And if any characters are going to have heart and soul, the two that love each other most should definitely be those bloody characters. So yeah, the, the end for me is beautiful and just not necessarily nailed by the various no. attempts at the writers. I'm going to give play. like just a couple of very quick follow-up things that happen. Uh, if you read the Charnel Congress book, there's an incident where Vlad gets sort of half resurrected by the Charnel Congress, uh, but Manfred uh, helps put a stop to that as well as Gotrek and Felix. Uh, Gotrek is the one who ultimately kills the suit. He's not truly Vlad because they don't have his ring. So they're not able to genuinely bring him back. It's more of a bastardized resurrection because he's more like a Vargolf than he is like actual Vlad. Gotrek kills him again. Uh, and then Manfred falls into the river after Gotrek chops his arm off. Um, then uh, much, much later, we get incidents with, uh, in the end times, Vlad is resurrected by Nagash. He becomes the Mortark of Night. Uh, and he is actually put in charge of the Empire because yes. Nagash, very, once again, to Nagash's credit, he can be clever when he wants to. He realizes Vlad understands the Empire better than anyone else and can genuinely defend it from chaos. That's why he wanted Vlad. Uh, so he puts Vlad in charge, and Vlad, to his credit, actually does a pretty good job. Uh, he does. After, he's, uh, he's back to being Vashinesh in many respects. Yeah, he actually holds out against Chaos for quite a while before he's pushed back by a couple things, most notably um, uh, just Nurgle's big, 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 big invasion. He shows up at the fall of Altdorf, where he is one of the three major defenders of Altdorf, mm -hmm. along with the Bretonians and the Empire. He mm -hmm. witnesses the death That's of Lewin Lanker being uh, brutally killed by Vestas the Leech Lord. And Vlad actually gets really fucking upset when Luinker yeah. dies because he realizes that Lu what kind of man Luinker is and the way Festus kills him is dirty and cheap. And Vlad gets so pissed that he not only kills Festus, but he stops Festus from becoming a demon prince, which is fucking awesome. And I love that scene. The way he yeah, kills Festus is great. Um, anyway, he, uh, he joins up with the humans after that and basically fights alongside them to the very, very end. Uh, right where the end. Yeah, they have the really, really big finale battle um, in Altdorf where Manfred and Vlad kind of mentally spar with one another, where I will say some of the writers do a really good job of Manfred realizing that his father loves him and having to come to term with the grips that his father is genuinely back and not the monster he remembers him as. And Manfred really fucking struggling with that. Like Vlad forgives him for betraying him. Flat out forgives him, which is good. Like that's the way Vlad should be written. And I think it's important to have that as well because um, uh, it allows the story of Manfred to make a bit more of sense if Manfred recognizes that Vashinesh had gone, Vlad had replaced him, and then when Vlad comes back, he recognizes that Vashinesh has returned. Um, but a lot of that is not really stated yeah, and in it's, black and it's white. It's very messy. And it's it's split, really it's messy. Um, and to make sense of it all, you have to just take a step back out of it and say, but if this is true, then why did this happen? That means all of these things must have happened for that to make sense, which means, well, that makes more sense of what Manfred did, right? Gotcha. And we've discussed it to a degree throughout this stream to try and make sense of how Vashinesh could become Vlad and how Vlad could become the monster that he had become and then how that monster could then become Vashinesh again come the end times. Um, and I, I really like Vlad's story. I think the whole thing is perfect. Um, I really dislike how they handled the romance aspects of it because it feels like it's written by a 14 year old with no real <laughs> grasp of what yeah. it is other than these fair, are monsters ah, ha, ha. Oh. Yeah, to be fair unfortunately games workshop didn't really start hiring women authors or like more experienced authors until like need a woman author to write romance 
Yeah, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying authors that have like different backgrounds. Yes, totally. uh, Until like the last 10 years or so, which is like, you know, post end times. Because like AOS has some awesome authors who are writing very different kinds of stories. Um, But anyway, so uh, yeah. And for those that care about end time shenanigans, uh, Isabella comes back as essentially kind of like a representative of Nurgle. Uh, She has actually a really nasty superpower where if she touches an undead, they just like explode into like plant bits. Um, but there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens. Manfred and Vlad kind of have a final showdown, but Isabella interrupts them and Manfred flees and Vlad, he could have fled, but he chose to fight because he figures out that long story short, Isabella, the reason she's kind of like bad is there's a greater demon of Nurgle inside of her. That's basically manipulating her and kind of like distorting her memories and doing a lot of shit to make her hate Vlad. Uh, it's a mess, but (laughs) Vlad realizing this, uh, they have their big final duel and Vlad allows her to touch him, which is going to kill him. She allows her, he allows her to touch him and he knocks them both off of a wall, mirroring their prior death. He takes off his ring and he forces it on Isabella's finger. And then the two of them hit a stake and they die. And Isabella, they both die, but Isabella is resurrected by the ring. But because of the way the ring works, she's purified of the demon. Like she comes back as just a vampire. And I will always fucking hate the writer that handled the aftermath of this because she comes back as an amnesiac who doesn't remember anything. And then the world ends. So there's no payoff to that. She just fucking, the world just, just blows up. Why? Right. Why? It would oh, so like, it's it's a, such a lovely scene. If, if the, <laughs> How if could the you world, ruin it? I know. If the world's going to end anyway. So this is the same author oh. who write the build up to that scene, which is great. Like Vlad, permanently dying to save his wife love it the fact that yep. she doesn't then have to wake up and realize what he did why there's no and, point <laughs> and if you've got yourself an isabella who had also died realizing that she was the reason for his fall seeing that thing and him giving his life for her she would hang on like all oh, bloody mighty to respect what he had just done her heart completely broken but not willing to kill herself this time it's such a beautiful setup for a marvelous complete limp damp biscuit of an ending it was so close to being great and was completely (laughs) rubbish damp squib fucking josh reynolds (laughs) so annoying yeah let's get into our lovely chat (laughs) he has so many good moments but so many moments where i'm like come on man all right anyway i mean mean, he set up the whole end anyway i know it works yeah Yeah, just right at the finale uh all right my dad has called recently games workshop stated the future story bits for uh the old world may likely jump back in a time from the current time an excellent army pair to bring two of the most popular legend forces back would be skaven versus vampires uh, yes. Uh, so yeah, there have been hints in the old world that although for right now they're focusing on the, the great war, th- that if the setting continues to make money and they finish the great war storyline, they might hop back to other things. So they might do like the vampire wars or the black plague or any of those, which would be super fun. I would love that a lot. Uh, Vi- uh Viper Wolf. We all know the forest goblins stopped the filth threats. I mean, forest goblins played a role. They did mm-hmm. genuinely. Uh, but Sylvania was saved and the Skaven were mostly distracted by Van Hal. Uh, Hammond, who are the Sinones tribe? Do they have any Anyone relation need. to the Bothani? Um, No, they're just another tribe. Yep. Uh, Slade, who made Isabella sick? Everyone! Yep. <laughs> uh, the Sinchmeister, how would Vlad view AOS Summer King Ushorin? I think he would pity him. I think he would pity him a lot for what Ushorin has become. Um <laughs> and uh, that would actually be a really fun thing. Granted, AOS Ushorin is not that different from the very last time we see Ushorin, where he has the crown of Nagash on, and he's like completely kind of lost it. Um, but I think Vlad would deeply pity him, to be frank. I agree. Uh, the Hobby Squire, Manfred doesn't like his new stepmom, Isabella. <laughs> I, I think that's very yeah. fair. Yeah. Um, or, or, or alternatively, um, particularly if he knew Neferata, perhaps he's also in love with her in a very weird way as well. There's all manner of weird, <laughs> odd love triangles that you could build out of that. And, you put, oh my God. and I think it would be beautiful a if comedy? it was written by a sensitive hand. I need, I need, y'all know that meme uh, from, I think it's from Community or something, where it's that guy looking at the computer and he's like, this better not awaken anything in me. Like, I would love, like, it's Manfred look, seeing Isabella and he goes, oh no, do I have mommy issues? Oh shit, do I have mommy issues? <laughs> yeah, oh dear. Uh, 
Electric Count Sterling. Oh, look at that art for his avatar project. Uh, just oh. a quick call there. Gary reckons his question was missed Ooh. earlier in the run. So just uh, that. That was before Mandatus Callum. It was before Mandatus. Um, and thanks for calling that out, Gary. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you know what? I can just go to this verse. The start bit, yeah. Um, no, no, I, I see. I, I see it. We're not there yet. We're not there yet. We're coming up to it. Um, Electric Count Sterling, why don't vampires raise a billion dead orcs slash Skaven? Because every corpse you have to raise takes effort. Not individually, maybe not a lot of effort, but that being said, like, if you're in the lore, anything that's dead will work. Skaven corpse is great. Orc corpse is great. They do that. In the tabletop game, in the video game, you would have to design an individual model to represent each of those, which is just why. It's going to have the same stats. It's not worth the effort. Yep, agreed. Um... Uh, Gary Reynolds, when did Vlad stop hiding his noseless guy? So vampires, oh, yeah, this is actually a great little thing to talk about real quick. Uh, yeah. Vampires true forms, quote unquote, is basically that. So when you're dealing with uh, like Lamians, they can use sort because remember they're corpses. They can use sorcery um, to make themselves look beautiful and young and wonderful. But some vampires don't bother because um, it requires like a little bit of maintenance. It requires a little bit of effort. And some of them, A, if you're terrifying, that's going to help you in a lot of circumstances. B, if your goal is just pure aggression, there's no need to hide what you really are and what dark magic or just being dead has done to you. So a lot of vampires will sometimes reach a point where they're like, all right, I'm casting off my glamours or I'm not bothering to use sorcery to hold my body together. And they look fucking horrific. Um, and, I'll, I'll go further than that. Um, many of them are also shapeshifters in a variety of ways. So um, they they literally change form, particularly in the Karstein uh, lineage, um, oh, yeah. where they come uh, the, the classic mists and wolves and all the rest of it. Um, and the mortal guys, for want of a better description, is something that many of them have an ability to do. But it's a little bit like clenching in that you can clench for so long until eventually you relax. Um, and those who have been doing it for a very long time they can clench for potentially years if they choose to do so. But during the height of Vlad's reign, they had no longer any requirement to be anything other than they were. And to a degree, Isabella reveled in this. Um, having said that, though, an awful lot of the art, particularly from the first time round, really did not portray him in that bestial visage. That's something that has been developed with each later iteration as they attempt to make him look bigger, meanier, and nastier. Um, but his core uh, behind it all can look just as devilishly handsome as he once did as and when he chooses to do so. Yeah, he doesn't have to be the noseless corpse form. He, yeah, he chooses to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you'll see that with, like, Necrarchs. Like, Necrarchs don't give a don't, shit about their appearance, kick, yeah. so they look absolutely hideous because they don't care. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, Randy Randy Rendo, would love to hear both of you talk about some of the more lesser-known Black Library books on my favorite series, Bruno the Bounty Hunter. Oh, mm -hmm. God, I fucking love Bruno the Bounty Hunter. It's an awesome series. Finally, stream that was somewhat related uh, to bring them up. Yep, yeah, he's yeah, thanks, Randy. Uh, we will almost certainly move on to that. I mean, there's been a because of this stream, One there's day. been a couple of calls for Genevieve, for example, and uh, Genevieve is also worth having a dive into at some point. Uh, uh, Marbrack A, what's up with people named Isabella falling in love with vampires? Like, you say hi to Maggie. <laughs> hey, hi, Maggie. Hi, Maggie. <laughs> uh, yeah, Isabella's yeah, those Bellas. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Genevieve stream win. Yeah, well, uh, there, there you go. Yeah, quite, uh, as I said. Yeah, Mr. Pig, uh, do you like Vlad using the end times to try and get legitimized as an elector count? And how he re how did he react to drinking the Nurgle-infected blood? Inquiring minds want to know what they've heard is correct. So uh, do I like him trying to legitimize his position as an elector count in the end times? Because if you look at it from the angle that he thought there was a good chance they would survive the end times, then yeah, I think that's reasonable um, that he's trying to find a more realistic way to interweave the undead and humanity especially because vlad seems to be one of the more tarks who's very much looking for a way to kill nagash before the end times are over uh, because he realizes what nagash will do like he knows nagash is not a good ally to have um uh and you know for vashanesh that seems like a pretty reasonable step yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, Vashanesh um, is definitely the sort who would be looking to take over the Empire um, because he is more... Because if he's an elector count, he could get elected. Absolutely. And if he wins and the end times are basically defeated by his blade, then we have ourselves an Empire 
run by at the very top vampires who are ultimately better and more capable of handling the necessities that leading an empire require now does that mean that he'll be well accepted by say the cult of sigmar well potentially hell no but already by this point to hark back to our previous chat there are vampires in the setting who have been accepted genevieve for example who saved emperor karl franz's life so there is definitely precedent and this is standing on the shoulders of that precedent. And it's one of the reasons why I kind of half prefer Genevieve potentially being of his bloodline rather than the Lamians. Yeah. Uh, and then to the second part of your question about the Nurgle thing. So in, in the story, because of his sword blood drinker, when he stabs somebody with it, it automatically drinks their blood and basically confers the magical power to him so that he's healing while he's fighting. Uh, and he stabs one of the Glotkin and it doesn't go well because it absorbs some nasty shit and it makes him sick until he gets killed. And then the ring fixes him when he comes back to life. Uh, that's reasonable. Um, like, especially the Glotkin, like they're borderline demon princes and, uh, blood that, uh, that introduces a really fun flaw to blood drinker. Yeah, um, I agree. That's a clear moment of what if, as in somebody's looked at an item and gone, well, what if it does that? Well, let's make it happen. And I really like it when uh, authors and writers take established things that uh, people look at and say, well, that freaking rocks. That's just going to kill that thing, isn't it? They're all going to die. And actually goes, no, there's going to be implications that stand beyond what you might first think. If you suck down hard on a bunch of Nurgle things, yeah, it's not going to do any good. And I think that's a good result. I really like that as a piece yeah, of and that's, um, and that's undercurrent world building. By... It's supported by prior lore as well. Because, like, the Strigoi yeah. became that twisted because they drank not good quality blood. So, like, if you're drinking bad shit as a vampire, it will affect you if you're not careful. Yeah, I I'm totally cool with that. Yeah. yeah. Isabella, I'm lonely, said while taking a bath of the combined blood of every servant in the castle after murdering them all. Vlad, I can fix her. <laughs> Um, I can fix so. Oh, oh man, the 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 oh, doom, the doom now so many, so many hopeless romantics. I can fix them. Um, all right, I can fix them. We're gonna blitz through questions. Um, okay, and blitz. Then... I'm no more than a sentence per answer. Let's see if we can do it. <laughs> all right, Andy. <laughs> um, uh, which children, if any, are Vlad? Is Vlad the most proud of? Uh, definitely Manfred. Manfred. That's probably it. Uh, granted, um, to be fair, Manfred... Proud is an interesting term, but I'd say Manfred. Yeah, to be fair, Manfred murdered all of his siblings. Um, yep. So, uh, let's see. Uh, Muffet Deluxe, would Vlad have been a better emperor than Karl Franz or than Boris Toddbringer? That depends on what you think makes a good emperor. Yes. Uh, Biofoot, why does Vlad hate the fishmen so much? He won't even be seen in the same room as them. What a racist. Moving on. Uh, <laughs> Vlad. He doesn't I'm like keeping how, my answer is super short. He doesn't I'm like how it. fishy they taste. I can That's what I say. <laughs> Uh, potato salad. What kind of meal would ogres make for Vlad? Uh, from Vlad. Uh, funny enough, ogres actually have a really fun established lore about their butchers about how they use various ingredients to do certain kinds of unique ideas into meals. Um, using vampire bits is something that a butcher would probably very much want. Vampires are very heavily infused with magic. That would probably have a unique impact on cooking for them. Mm. Should make a cookbook of horrible, disgusting garbage made by butchers. Anyway, uh, Dawi 4, Vlad being the father of the bloodline, what are the powers, traits, and features that he rose with that are engraved with the bloodline? Uh, the big ones are control over the weather, which is a weird one, but super fucking cool. Because uh, Vlad was really well known for summoning storms to block out sunlight for his armies. And a lot of von Karstein descendants are able to do that, which is crazy powerful. Um, uh, Shapeshifting, like Andy said, turning into wolves and bats is a big thing for von Karsteins. Also, control over animals is a big thing for von Karsteins. They're very good at it. Um, those are probably the biggest. And also, usually a good balance between fighting capability and sorcery. Uh, the Von Karsteins are the most balanced bloodline when it comes to those aspects of combat, whereas like your Strigoi and your, or sorry, your Lamians and your Blood Dragons tend to be more martial prowess, but a little weaker on the magic side. And then your Strigoi are usually like big hucking juggernauts and sometimes magically powerful, but they're not very clever. And your Necrocks are like super magically powerful, but are pretty weak on the uh, martial prowess side. Von Karsteins tend to be fairly balanced. Yeah, agreed in that. I'd, I'd also add that there's quite a few mentions of people falling under their thrall. Um, so clearly they've got some mind control kicking around in there as well. Yeah. 
Um, also, they uh, their big downside is Von Karsteins are the bloodline seems to have a curse for ambition. Um, mm -hmm. Is their like big problem uh, because they're it's noted they are more obsessed with building up kingdoms and empires than any other bloodline. Like they can't seem to help themselves. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, is Vlad more magically inclined or martially inclined? He's balanced. Vlad yep, is the balanced. most balanced Mortar or uh, uh, vampire. Period. And I, I would say in general, he's probably one of the best by some significant measure because he is an extraordinarily capable um, fighter, general, and wizard. Yeah, like even, even like Man I think Manfred in the grand scheme could be argued to be the most powerful vampire, but he's tied with Vlad. And Manfred is yeah. only able to keep up with him because he's a much more powerful wizard. Yeah, they're, they're a nice balance between the two of them. One's yeah. better at some things, the other one's better at others. Yeah, but Vlad is, like, of the original vampires, I say Vlad is easily number one, because he, yeah. he had a good mix. Uh, Aishin, where did Vashanesh get the name Vlad von Karstein from? Are the von Karsteins named after the ring, or is the ring named after them? Ooh, boy. Um, the ring is named after them, almost certainly. The Karsteins are an ancient empire family that have been kicking around uh, in the empire since the time of Sigmar. So, pretty much, the ring is now named for the, uh, that. Yeah, I do, uh, though Andy like mentioned earlier, if you want to run with a really fun idea for a campaign or something, especially if you have a descendant of someone who's like related to Von Karsteins, the idea that they were a line set into motion by Vashanesh and Manfred in ancient times and they've been kind of following them over the years is a fucking cool idea. Yeah, I think there's a very strong likelihood that um, Sigmar um, met Vashanesh. Oh yeah, that yeah, I would agree with that. And it's not just likely. slightly strong, I think it's very likely and it would not surprise me if he was part of Nagash's downfall. Hmm. Scythe Petals, is Vlad and Isabella's romance a better love story than Twilight? Uh, I would say yes, definitely, especially because there are actually elements of Twilight that kind of, I don't think she read the story, but are stolen from a lot of very fu fun concepts. Like the whole idea of like, oh, make me a vampire, and him being like, no, I don't want you to turn into a vampire because it's awful. That's a, I'm sorry that I know this. That's a key part of the plot in Twilight, <laughs> but it's also a key part of the, the Vlad and Isabella storyline. Yes, will be my answer. Uh, Charles, uh, did he just make up the name Von Karstein and did he take it from somewhere else? We already answered that. Uh, yep. uh, oh, that's kind of an interesting one. Do, do you think Vlad in his inner, inner monologue or self-identity thinks of himself as Vlad Von Karstein or do you think he thinks of himself as Vashanesh? It's been too much time he'll think of himself as Vlad, but uh, Vashanesh was someone he once was. Yeah. I agree. I think he allowed um, he's been Vladimir. Um, he's been over in Kislev. He's been around all over the place. He's been using that guys for centuries. He just is Vlad. Uh, let's see. Uh, considering how old Vlad is, do we know Vlad's opinions about some of the most historic moments of Vampire Ken, such as the Siege of Magritta, in which Wazorin uh, was defeated by Aberash, or Melchior's raging madness and the uh, life of his apprentice Zacharias? A lot, well, a lot of these things are post. A couple of these are post Vlad. Not all of them. Uh, mm -hmm. average way of dealing with the thirst for blood by so i i think vly would have lightly kept up with his kin and probably found certain aspects interesting but i think we covered that pretty well when we talked about neferata and kind of the fall of the vampires mm -hmm. um uh let's see which classic interpretation of dracula is vly closer to sir christopher lee or bella lugosi I'm assuming those are actors. So like yes, they are. Um, uh, in terms of his overall height, definitely Christopher Lee and the deep throaty roundness of his voice. So I definitely see Lee out of the two of those. I miss Christopher Lee. He was a fucking goat. Um, yep, uh, let's see. If an ogre butcher used Vlad as an ingredient, would they gain his regeneration? Probably. Well, vampires in general, probably actually. Um, but I don't think there would be anything particularly special out of Vlad compared to regular vampires with the way butchers would work. Uh, Maharaja of Anne, if Vlad took over the empires of the god of the empires, try more direct action. That's a really great question. I don't know. It would be a super fascinating outcome, and it's something that I'm rather sad has never come to pass. Yeah, because vampires are notoriously anti-god because of the nature of their existence. Yeah, so material creatures. Gods do not go yeah, on. Yeah, so well. with how active gods are can be in the empire, that would be a fascinating story to explore. Castrated, mm -hmm. if someone were to refer to Vlad as Vashanesh, would he get defensive upset? No, I think he's too calculating for that. Um, yeah, unless, I, it was I, like, unless it was like Vlad before his death, in which case he might just get really fucking angry. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a different life, really, isn't it? It's a name that comes from the echoing halls of his past. Quite literally, he has died and moved on from that. <laughs> it's a dead name in the literal sense. Yeah. Uh, what? Uh, let's see, Don Orso, what gives Vlad and the Von Karsteins their seeming power over beasts? Uh, it, 
I, I don't think there's an easy answer I can give you other than it's just an element of their bloodline. It's really, there's no clear cut explanation to how the elixir of immortality gave them specific powers. Um, it seems to be a reflection of their nature. So maybe there's something about Vashnesh and his relationship yeah. to peace. Uh, but I, now, I this is clearly a Vashnesh thing that has not been properly explored because basically they've gone here. What does Kondracula do? Copy paste. Um, and they haven't really thought about what that means when they take Vashnesh as the actual source of that, where the characters that they have created themselves are much better reflected in terms of their powers and their capabilities. So I would broadly say someone hasn't written Vashnesh properly yet. Yeah, yeah, he should have like a very loyal, like a thing for running like a kennel or have like a very strong affinity for something. animals or something to explain that. Uh, Darth Mahal, oh, I love this question. Is Vlad aware uh, Manfred is responsible for his death? He figures it out when he gets back like almost immediately. Yeah. Um, but a fun fact is that one of my favorite iterations of Manfred that authors have done is that Manfred has some really interesting trauma relating to betraying and killing Vlad where he hears Vlad's voice in his head um, kind of guiding him. Um which if I think if you're writing Manfred well, Manfred would feel trauma about killing. Yeah, I, I, not just trauma. I think that in many respects is what sends Manfred from being the scholar into the king um, as he moves towards his own vampire wars in the future. I would suggest that that trauma is deep, abiding, and changes his uh, path as much as Isabella had changed Vladimir's path. Uh, let's see. I think we've already talked about uh, a lot of these uh why does vlad care so much about ruling the empire why not go after another human nation i think he sees more potential in the empire um uh, would probably be the way i would initially argue it though i'm sure his goal would be to expand beyond that it's a good yeah, starting and, point and if we go with many of the stories we've suggested here that uh it's because that's where isabella is yeah and also keep in mind that the empire was also in a, a fairly vulnerable position at this Very time vulnerable. compared to these other human nations yeah, I don't think of the Empire in its currently its current modern form. The Empire is fractured, utterly broken. Vlad is the answer. Uh, Malsar, do vampires really have a decision in things they want to do, or are they doomed to pursue the things in life that they wanted? Um, that's a difficult question to answer, and it would depend on the vampire. A lot of them do kind of have obsessions with things that they were obsessed with in life, but you know, I wouldn't say that they're doomed to it. It's yeah, just a matter much. of their willpower. Agreed. Pretty much every vampire is written differently in Warhammer anyway, so there is no consistent answer to that. Some of them are entirely obsessed with things that others don't even consider. So loosely speaking, it depends on the bloodline, how they manifest. We've not dumped into all the bloodlines, really. And it also depends just how far away they are from being the original. The original vampires are almost certainly much more self-possessed than some of the later ones, many of whom just completely lose themselves. Yeah, Wohi well, 3, how would an event like the Vampire Wars affect human culture, religion, architecture? Uh, we actually talked about that a lot, that uh, like Altdorf has completely changed a lot of its emblems and banners and stuff yep. because of the Vampire Wars. Um, also, a lot of the Empire got into blessing architecture, so making sure that when walls were built, they either had dwarven runes or they were fully blessed by lots of priests to resist and repel undead because they realized it was a problem. Yeah, particularly with, Man with Manfred as well, because Manfred, yeah, Manfred was dirty. Um, oh, yeah. Manfred was very good at his job. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, during the end times, I heard Vlad became an electric count. No, he didn't. He tried to, but, uh, well, actually, okay. Kurt Helborg says, yes, you are an electric count. And then Kurt Helborg dies, and Carl, Carl Franz, who's actually Sigmar, says, yeah, no, you can't be, because according to the way I wrote the laws, you have to be human. Um, and v Vlad goes, well, that's weak sauce. And then they don't have a chance to talk about it again before the end of the world. It's just bullshit. <laughs> which is hilarious. I would love like a lawyer court battle of trying to finagle that out, which would be really funny to me. Um, why did Vlad kill this joy after they came to help him? I think we answered that suitably. He saw they were falling and what they were going to become and realized they were a threat. Um, how do vampires from other bloodlines see Vlad? Uh, I think deep, deep down, many of them would respect him, but vampires tend to have a very self-aggrandizing way to present things. So they would probably mock him openly while respecting him deeply or being fucking terrified of him. I would be happy to say that you name a way to think of him. There is a vampire who thinks that. Yep. I uh, love you finally doing Vlad. I uh, always thought Vlad was more interesting and diverse than Manfred. No. Nope. 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 Y'all just have... Y'all read too many Wikipedia entries on Manfred without understanding what makes Manfred Manfred. He is a fucking awesome character. Manfred's Don't get great. hooked up. Don't get hooked up I mean, on that. I love Vlad. 
I, I just to make it clear, super love Vlad, but Manfred is also freaking great. I I'll really put, love I'll put it this way. Manfred is one of the very few characters that if we do a lore beards, I genuinely think we'd have to do it in two parts. Mm, there's a lot to do. I'll put it that way. Uh, I know for power vampires, just how old they are. That's not technically true. Um, some vampires are relatively young and insanely powerful. See Zacharias the ever living, very young vampire. Oh, crap, Conrad as well. Yeah. Um, so there are some vampires that are brutally young, but extremely powerful. Most of the yeah, time yeah. it's how closely related they are to a founder vampire. That usually determines how strong they're going to be. Not always, but that's uh, that's a good rule of thumb. Mm. Uh, is Vlad and Isabella the only real love story of vampires? No, no, nope. no. Tons of vampires have critical love stories. Uh, Ulrika, Vlad, Neferata. Julie, Neferata, actually pretty much all of them. Yeah. Abarash, um, usually you don't get a love story if it's a like a Necrarch. Other, if it's not a Necrarch, there's probably a love story involved. Um, I feel that Vlad had a lot of respect for Aberash. How much interaction did these two have? Back in the day, a lot. Since then, very little. Yep, yep. Uh, half crowd. Vlad was fighting his divided empire. We started the vampire wars. How close was he to conquering the entire empire? Pretty fucking close. Yeah. If he if he had won the siege of Altdorf, I don't think anybody could have stopped him. Yeah, I think the only holdout he would have probably had after that would have been Midnight. Yeah. And Manfred trying to find a way to kill him. Honest, honestly, without Manfred, the empire was fucked. Yes. Manfred um, saved the empire. Uh, if Vlad did conquer slash make the empire great again, what changes would he make to a lot of things? Ah, I'm oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. We don't have time for that, but he would probably implement a lot of, he would probably take a lot of the bits and pieces that he's yep. taken from all sorts of different nations and cultures and try to make something new. He would bring peace. He would bring order. He would bring, um, a breakdown of all the grand provinces from being independent and he would bring them underneath his rule. Yep. Uh, let's see. What does Vlad do about the very obvious threat of the Skaven Under Empire? That's a great fucking question because he's that is. surely aware of it. Uh, oh no, he oh, is yeah. aware of it. He dealt with yeah. the Black Plague. Um, yeah. he, would, he would probably have contingencies. That would probably be mm -hmm. something he would be very strongly thinking about. Um, would love, honestly, would love to see his take on it. Uh, say Vlad ruled the Empire for 100 years. How would that change foreign relations? One thing you'll note about Vlad, the dwarves did not participate in the Vampire Wars because Vlad knew how to placate them. The dwarves did not get involved until Conrad, because Conrad, in his stupidity, well, in his madness, fucks, he fucks with the dwarves and Conrad. pisses them off. Vlad knew how to handle dwarves and elves, I would argue. Vlad would have been able to maintain those alliances. Think about how fucking crazy that is with how we now, in the modern age, look at the vampires. Vlad could have pulled it off. That's how good he was. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, uh, I'm going to play Fowls and Thrones. Oh, God, good luck. Um, <laughs> good luck, my friend. That's a bitch of a campaign. It's a fragmented campaign, if ever there was a fragmented campaign. Uh, is there any information on what happened to the ring after the Vampire Wars? Read the Toronto Congress book. Uh, it's a Go Trek Felix book. It talks about the ring and that Manfred is the only person that knows where he is. It also heavily implies he murdered Felix Mann and hid the ring, and only Manfred knows where it is. Yep. Server of the Great Heart Rat. Is Vlad dead? Yes. Uh, do you think Vlad would ever forgive Manfred? He did. So, yes. Um, was Vlad, do you think Vlad ever got close to one of the dragons in Cathay? Maybe Zhao Ming, for instance. That's a great theory. Um, I think there's a very strong possibility of that. I think the chance of it not happening is almost none. This dude is pure charisma. Yeah, especially with how many lovers the dragons take, you know yeah. stuff went down. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, how do you think the confrontation between Vlad and Neferata will go down after all this time? It would probably be really sad, honestly. Yeah. Um, if it was if it was pre death Vlad, so like Vlad with Isabella, Vlad would probably be kind of angry and uncontrollable. His outburst would probably kind of alarm Neferata, to be honest, because he would be very different than what she remembers. Um, Grumbardo, so I have a campaign where my party is in the time of Magnus, but Vlad, what is Vlad doing near the end of the war against Chaos? He's dead. Uh, Vampire Wars have been over for hundreds of years by that point. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, your opinion, Ma Vlad versus Manfred, who wins? Uh, uh, honestly, I think. I think Manfred would probably win because Vlad I is one. Agree. Of, Vlad. I, I would say that <laughs> Vlad is one of the only characters who would genuinely struggle with the whole like I can't kill my son dynamic. And I, I think Manfred would do the same. Um, I I I think it would be. Uh, truth be told, it's just, it's almost um, it's it's a little Talk bit like saying, I don't know. who's going to win between Tyrion and Teclis. They're just not going to fight until obviously they do. Um, and yeah, it, it's it's a tit for tat one. There is no real winner. I only said the opposite because 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was one side, I, I, was I also <laughs> enjoy contrarian things. Uh, I think of the other progenitors. He loved one of them, probably respected Aberash, probably despised the fuck out of the other four because they were monstrous. Yeah. Utter monsters. Um, Ushorin did not become better until Vlad no longer knew him. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Why did Vlad go specifically to Sylvania raise his army? We talked about that. Uh, who would Vlad choose to succeed him if he knew he was going to die? Probably Manfred. Manfred. Uh, thoughts on Total War Warhammer's interpretation of Vlad, how he works in the game. Ah, he's fine. Uh, I, I really, I really hope they. A lot of people have been pushing, and I'm pretty sure CA is going to do it when they have the chance. A lot of people are really hoping they will make Vlad added to the Elector Count mechanic, so he's the Elector mm -hmm. Count of Sylvania, and he can play in that system. Um, that would be a really good way to just make him super fun and make sense. Uh, it, it's just a super fun addition in general, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'm well behind uh, that. Uh, get, yeah, give it to him and Isabella because if you play as either of them, the other one becomes a legendary hero, which I will say, CA. Thank you for doing that. That was, it took a long time for us to get that fix, but I'm really glad we got it. Um, which also, the fact that you can have Vlad as not a lord, but a hero if you choose Isabella, fucking great. Because a lot of people would have been like, oh, it should be Vlad, not Isabella, because Isabella shouldn't be legendary lord. The fact you get to choose is very good. I give Agreed. full props to CA on that. Um, I salute thee, CA. Uh, do you think Vlad the Dad could have negotiated being as an electric count in the grand scheme of things? Uh, if he hadn't fallen like we kind of talked about, he did. Vashinesh, yes. Vlad, no. No. Yeah, I completely agree. Vashinesh, yes. Vlad, no. Uh, if the Empire was... Wait, I, um, unfortunately, I don't understand what this question is asking. I'm going to skip. Um, did, did the Von Steins ever take to the sea? Some of them did, eventually. Not during Vlad's era, because it was a land war. Uh, but was Vlad, did Vlad travel the oceans? Yes, absolutely. And Vashinesh went to the sea as well when he was uh, fighting on behalf of Nagash back and in remember, the day. And remember, the biggest, baddest vampire on the seas, Count Noctilus, is a Von Karstein. Mm -hmm. um, do the vampire coast ever beat the vampire counts? Yes, because they, they're literally the same thing. The, the difference is not as big as you think it is. It's not. Uh, uh, what are the vampire, how are the vampire counts at sea? If it's like a regular vampire count, it depends on what kind of people he's raised. Vampires tend to avoid the ocean because water can be a problem for them. Um, yeah, many, but generally fresh running water is the problem that they particularly have. Yeah, yeah. Like the ocean, not great. It's literally full of Gyran and Gur, um, yeah. which the Gyran is not great. If you're a vampire, you want to avoid that. No, it is not. Um, does Vlad think Nagash is weak? I think the Gash... Vlad would probably think Nagash is not weak. He would probably understand if Vlad is, Vlad is uh, Nagash is horrifically powerful. I think I mean, he would. Who's enslaved him? No, yeah, weak is I, not the word I would use. I think Vlad would very much say no. He's not weak, but he's flawed. Um, and needs the to be stopped. In the Ulrika trilogy, they mentioned her bloodline is mixed between Lamian and Von Karstein. How do they mix? Oh, okay. The super fast thing is that blood kiss doesn't is not necessarily a one-time thing. Vampires can take blood from other vampires, which is a super fascinating concept and really awesome, which is why you have a lot of vampires that don't really make sense within just one bloodline because they're actually like a mutt, essentially. That happens a lot. Um, Manfred, in his story, actually drinks the blood of a lot of different vampires to make himself more powerful, which is really cool. We don't have time to explain. Vote for a Manfred stream if you want to learn more about that. Um, uh, let's see. Are there any other examples of high-profile ro romances in the lore? Check out Neferata and Aberash. Their story is really sad and romantic, um, and also is never consummated, which makes it even more heartbreaking and like stabs you in the nuts kind of thing. Um, <laughs> Ulrika also uh, Ulrika has some really good stuff, not necessarily with vampires though, um, but she, Ulrika loves several humans, and it never works out. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, also, Genevieve. Genevieve has a good love story. Uh, how is Sylvanian romantic culture different to other places in the world? We don't have time for that, but it's uh, diff it's different because it's culturally, um, in you know, involved. Culturally unique, yeah, totally. Did Vlad and Isabella have pet names for each other? Yes. Do I know them? No, but they absolutely had pet names for each other. Vladdy so, baby. Yeah, <laughs> Vladdy daddy. There you go. Uh, ugh. Uh, before, I I'm fine with that as a joke name, but as like a realistic pet name, that is not a good pet name. Uh, before the end times, what oh, what battle did Vlad von Karstein have the most difficulty with? Um, pr honestly, probably the one where uh, if you're he died. Discount, yeah, <laughs> discounting the one he died because that's cheating. I think the one where he fought the Grand Master of the White Wolf was probably the battle where he because he lost that battle. Yeah, like he, he lost. Um, so probably uh, I which that guy's name I know was Jaeger, I think or uh, Yerick. Yer Yerick, that's Yerick. right. Yerick probably gave him the most problems. Um, in the grand scheme. Uh, what was Vlad's relations with the original? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Did Vlad know of Cetra? Yeah, he was a legend and he's the yeah. direct descendant of him. He probably respected him, but knew he was a dick. 
Um, Someone who's running Wolf Rep is a set of vampires in Sylvania. What are places of interest or fun stories? Ooh, quick places of interest. Go read Dark Nice Dark Masters. It's got everything you need. Yep, Nice Dark Masters. It's a good place to begin for vampires and role play. Yeah, and it's also got a lot of places of interest in Sylvania. Uh, also, you can easily find PDFs of the 7th edition, 8th edition uh, Vampire Count Army books, which also were really good about showing off places of interest. And um, you'll find the map of Sylvania that I did um, for that book will be online somewhere. It's on one of my websites somewhere. So yeah, definitely go check out the Sylvania map. There's loads of interesting places, including in unique, interesting gods that you only get in Sylvania, like Bailarak and similar. Uh, does Vlad have more first-generation vampires... Oh, Devon, make more first generation vampires from taking Sylvania. Uh, if you're if you're viewing the original seven as zero generation, first generation, there were five uh in Sylvania. There's probably more somewhere else in the world. Yeah, Manfred twice. killed all of them, except for Conrad, who died somewhere else. Um <laughs> Manfred is the only one left in Sylvania. He made sure of that. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, how powerful is he compared to Lamian Necrock vampires? Uh, Vlad would probably be like if you're comparing him to Wazorin, he's probably weaker magically than Wazorin, but stronger magically than any of the other any of the other three, or uh, any of the other five. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Though, granted, we don't know a lot about Herakte and Matmeses. They're fairly mysterious. Fair. Um, how would an interaction between Kalida and Vlad go? Not great. Kalida hates vampires. Just a fundamental thing. She would not give a shit who Vlad was. She would try to kill him. He's a vampire. Yep. Period. End of story. Uh, Vlad would probably be like, "Oh, you're that, you're that cousin that traumatized my wife. I remember you." <laughs> That'd actually be kind of funny. Um, what are the info, uh, limitation of Vlad's ring? Barely any. Um, yeah, as far as we can tell, pretty much none. It's extraordinarily powerful. Um, it doesn't appear to have any limitations in the same way that Nagash himself has no limitations to his returning after he dies. Yeah, I, if you wanted to, you might be able to argue there are certain weapons like the Soul Destroyers that might have a funky interaction with it. But interestingly, mm -hmm. they probably wouldn't stop his body from regenerating. Yeah. It might just affect how his mind came back. It, it, because they don't, strictly speaking, have as a soul as it's understood. Go check um, the Lieber Necris for a good breakdown about some of the differences between how the soul is. But the physical body is a part of a component part of one's soul, if you run by those. And the, all of the material components of a vampire are it. Um, so the soul destruction stuff that works at etheric energies does not work. So the vast majority of ways of destroying them don't, simply can't work because they are materially grounded. Yep. Uh, Jeff, oh, this is a great question. How do uh, humans of the general populace view stories of benevolent vampires in the modern age, such as Jivan, Eve, Ulrika, or ancient tales of Ushorin? Depends on the person, depends on their culture. There are no ancient tales of Ishorin. Well, That's the Strigani, sort of the Strigani have passed down. Like, <laughs> you know, um, uh, you, you take a look at how the Strigani view vampires. The vast majority of them are terrified of them and, and think about what may have come beforehand as nothing more than a, a myth at best. And Genevieve is a very, very quiet. Yeah, and you have to remember, there are a lot of people in the Empire that are so unexposed to vampires, they genuinely believe vampires don't exist. Yeah, um, and w those who do hear of them will hear of them through mouthpieces like Priests of Sigmar, who will be decrying the evils of the undead, of anything that isn't human. So the vast majority, at beyond 99.9%, .9 would be, yeah, no, kill it. Yeah, and think of it, Genevieve is literally a hero. She saved Karl Franz's life. That's canon, full-on canon. Mm -hmm. She's very, she is a hush-hush. Like, mm -hmm. it, she's allowed to live in Altdorf, but she's not allowed to interact with the common people. That's against the mm -hmm. rules. Um, was Vlad's or origin supplemented after the character was introduced or was Vlad introduced together with his origin story? That's a great question. So like the original introduction into Warhammer Fantasy, like his first print was, did he come with his origin story or was that added later? Um, yeah, oh, pretty much all of it. And the Undead Army list, go back to it. That's about 1994. Three, four, somewhere around there. No, I was working there, so that's 1994, five. Um, when it very first came out, included all of the story that we already know for Nagash, for Vlad, for Isabella. The whole lot is in there. There's even a beautiful picture of Vlad um, in that book, uh, the very first proper depiction of him. And it's, again, far less the bestial, noseless version that we know, a much more the classic vampire with high collars and flickering cloak. Yeah, so I believe that would be fourth four edition. It's fourth edition, yes. Yeah. Uh, so you can probably find that online very easily. Oh, uh, yeah. It'll be out there uh, somewhere. Uh, do the vampire lineages have different magic traits? Yes, a lot. 
Oh, mm-hmm. as in, are they drawn to different winds of magic? So, such as the uh, Neferatus, Lamians seem to be uh, very attuned to Olgu, Strigoi seem to be more attuned to Gur. Uh, would that apply to other vampire bloodlines? I think that's a reasonable theory. Yeah, I mean, magic is magic and is attracted <laughs> to certain things. There is a great deal of lore of beasts running through almost everything the Karsteins do as well. So, yeah, definitely. Did Nagash. Oh, what would Nagash's ring do to a mortal? Uh, or uh, Vlad's ring due to a mortal. Probably not a lot. I think you have to be undead for it to work. Yep. Uh, what kind of ruler was Vlad? As Vashanesh, he was an excellent ruler. The longer he lived, and with everything that happened with Isabella, he became... Uh, he was effective, would be a fair way to put it, but he became a very different kind of ruler. Yeah. Uh, brutal. Very brutal. Um, okay, yeah. last two questions. If vampires are so intrinsically linked with dark magic, dark magic always corrupts, how come Vlad doesn't lose his noble values and goals? He did. We covered he that. He did. Uh, last question. <laughs> How does the halfling vampire that Conrad made uh, be the reason for some bad things happening in the moot? <laughs> that story. So the funny thing is an author threw that in, I think in seventh edition and the later authors clearly were like, no, it didn't. Or there's, I think there's actually even a mention that Manfred hunts it down and kills it later. Uh, Cause he viewed it as an abomination. That's a really funny story. Because it's very hard to tell if that's still canon or not. <laughs> because, mm-hmm. like, can a halfling turn into a vampire? Yeah, there's been I a couple. Of, there's been a couple of halflings that were vampires in the lore beyond that as well. Back in first edition, more fantasy roleplay, there's one as well. Um, and vampirism, as it currently is, is almost entirely and uniquely a human condition. Yeah, um, my my, I'll put it this way for you. My head canon is that humans and halflings and ogres are adjacent enough that they can, which implies that there could be an ogre vampire, which would be one of the scariest fucking final bosses for anything ever. Yeah, nobody wants one of those. And the fact that there isn't any anywhere suggested does make it feel unlikely that they can. Yeah, because you, you know there had yeah, to be a Necron. Someone would have, a Necron someone would have tried. tried. <laughs> yeah, definitely. They definitely would have tried. All right, There's no chance. That, uh, oh yeah, we got just some last second super chats. Y'all sneak we got in some in other super chats coming in here. We're well, super we over time, but that's okay. You know what? It's Vlad. We'll make an exception. Uh, Watchdog, mm-hmm. what happens to a vampire's soul when they're destroyed for good? You can't. There is, you can't destroy them for good. Put it this way. Think of it this way. The world ended. All of reality was torn asunder, devoured by chaos, and blew up. They still came back. Nagash still was able to bring back Neferod and Manfred and Ushorin and uh, Abarash, according to some stories, without great difficulty. That's mm-hmm. how fucking durable vampire souls are. Yeah, you, vampire. They, canonically, it, they cannot be permanently destroyed. Yeah, because um, uh, basically put it this way, everything that they are composed of never goes away, which means that their atoms, when scattered, can just be pulled back together by the correct ritual. Um, that atom is forever intrinsically linked to their soul because they're material creatures. Yeah, which uh, luckily for them, canonically, it says that when they die, for them, it's just oblivion. There is no afterlife. It's just nothingness. Uh, they see nothing. Yeah, uh, which is good. Like, because theoretically, it's like if their consciousness continued after they were torn apart, that would suck. Uh, but luckily, they don't. Um, so it seems literally the only limitation, at least according to AOS lore, which I like this because it reinforces the old lore, is just if somebody has the knowledge to put and desire to put them back together. Yep, that's pretty much always been the lore for Warhammer right back. Yep. Uh, Manfred, who would win Manfred versus Vlad? I refuse. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, for those curious about the Who Would Win series, it will return someday in the future. There are things I'm we'll trying to finagle about it. Um, so it'll come back someday. Uh, there might be a little bit of a break from it, but we might do something else in the meantime. So keep your ears out for that. Uh, Mendoza's, nah, we just have end times trauma when it comes to Manfred. Y'all do, yes. And, we, and we're trying to solve that. We're trying to put y'all through Manfred therapy. It'll take time, but we'll get you there. Don't worry. <laughs> what is the Blood Dragon's relationship with Vlad? Something that's actually very fascinating to me is that Vlad refused to call in the Blood Dragons during the Vampire Wars. It was actually Conrad that got the Blood Dragons involved, which almost seems to speak to Vlad did not want them involved, which yeah. is interesting. There's just, there's something there, there's and I think it's there. something that is worth investigating because it wasn't properly investigated. Yeah, because uh, it says it, supposedly it, Wallach, Wallach Harkin got involved because of Conrad's Why? bloodlust and because Conrad let him do what he wanted. Vlad wouldn't, which goes to show, I think, of something about the blood dragons that's eyebrow raising. It does. I agree. 
Uh, though, though, to be fair, uh, Vlad did have his own vampire cavalry. They were the, um, oh, oh God, I forgot what they're called. The, the Knights of Castle Dragonhof are a vampire knight regiment. They have a title. For the life of me, I can't remember what they're called. Um, but there was a vampire cavalry unit in Vlad's armies, but they were von Karsteins. They were not blood dragons. Karsteins, they certainly were. Uh, Watchdog. Oh, I think we already... I think you've gone the wrong way. You need. Oh, you were I going up, go not way. down. Uh, you're going up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, it's because the stupid... It was loading more comments and it kept me back down. Uh, okay. Is that all of them? Is that all of them? No, there's more. Would an elven vampire of different powers. They don't exist. I, I, they can't <laughs> exist as far as I'm concerned. Cubicle 7 made one and I bitched about it so much that they actually reprinted it and got rid of him. I'll put Goodbye. it that way. <laughs> Quite right, too. <laughs> Canonically, there are no elf vampires. Cry about it. Uh, Cole Patterson, did Vlad and Noctilus have a relationship? No, Noctilus was uh, turned much later. Um, he probably he never knew Vlad. Yep. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Well, happy Indeed, and Patrick's also Day. on that happy birthday, mom. Oh yeah. Oh, that's sweet. Happy birthday to Andy's mom. Uh, CP four N. Next, who would win? Vlad versus Nandor the Relentless. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Nandor. <laughs> okay, we're caught up. All right. Is that the mole? Last one. So it takes nuclear fission to truly kill vampires. You know what? If you're going down to the atomic level, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I mean, it's difficult to tell if even that would do it, given the way Warhammer works. Um, but yeah, maybe. The Drakenhof Templars. Thank you. Yes, the Drakenhof Templars That's is the, the Knight Regiment. It's not a very good name. I'm not no, surprised. it's very bad. I was come back to mind. Yeah, yeah. Something a little... They could have done something a little more exciting there. Um... Though, interestingly, I would have loved if someone wanted to ever write, you could have a really fun thing of some confusion among, like, legends because the symbol of Dragonhof is a dragon. Uh, mm -hmm. So people would think, oh, they're blood dragons, but they're not. Uh, they're von Karsteins, which could lead to some really fun little things there in legends and myths. Good. All right. So we arrive at the end of our marvelous Vlad von Karstein stream. I think we can say without any fear of doubt, that Vashinesh is Vlad. And if you don't agree, tough. Because we <laughs> think he is. And that's basically it. Vashinesh was the proudest of generals, a noble that only the houses of Nehekara can truly produce, and was, quite frankly, the most broodiest, coolest, sexiest of all folks around that Neferata herself went, oh yes, yoink, you're mine. Through the course of time, his extraordinary skills as both a tactician and also a wizard had led him into a position of a general for not just Nagash, but for his own forces with Isabella, his great love by his side, as he attempted to take down the empire and then later do much the same, but for Nagash behind him. He is, I think, one of the worst written characters that Games Workshop has with some of the coolest stories. And by that, I mean that there is so much extraordinarily awesome that the character could have been doing with his various motivations. But all of it has to be extrapolated from the existing lore. The lore itself basically says, Vasnesh was great, right? Yeah, stuff. Love Neferata and stuff. Uh, yeah, here's Nagash. Oh, uh, yeah, Nagash. And oh, he was angry. Oh, he's dead now. Um, oh, there's Vlad. Vlad's really angry, but he was a really good king to begin with. But now he's really angry. Why? No one knows. He just is. Loves Isabella. Why? No one knows. Just does. And most of the background is written like that. But if you take a little look between the lines, it's not just a deep and engaging story. It's also one that is also filled with a, a great amount of heart. Because this is a character who actually does and is motivated by love. And that is something that is not just rare in the Warhammer world. It's almost non-existent in that oh, there's a whole bunch of, oh, I love this person, love that person. But that's generally just to kill them, to use them as motivation as another character. Is yes, the, the infamous wife fridging. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> fridging all over the place where, where Vlad and Neferata and then later Vlad and Isabella, I think is a beautiful story but one that has been so cack-handedly presented that we're just left at the end going, I think I love this character, but not because Games Workshop wrote it well. Yeah, welcome to Warhammer lore. <laughs> <laughs> In a nutshell. Thank you, Andy. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. I, I just have to point out this comment. If someone wants to have a ball with fan fictioning and thinking of potentials, having the idea that Vlad knew Shiyama, the death dragon, uh, maybe before she went beneath the spirit river and she died, you could do some crazy shit with that. I think that would be lovely. And if you continue the tragedy of Vlad, of he takes a dragon as a lover, but she dies to become something to serve her father. Ooh, 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 the spice. Oh, the spice. Uh, Necromancer Cobalt. I like to think the Manfred of the End Times is more of a hat. <laughs> it's passed around to multiple characters. Yeah, Manfred yeah. of the End Times. Yeah, whose oh. fault is it? Uh, yeah, we, the... we are going to do an End Time stream again at some yeah, point. This year, this year, part two. This year, it will come four. this year, but by the gods, when we eventually get there, we are going to tear it a new one. All right. Anyway, uh, <laughs> thank you all so much for joining us. This is the, I think this is the longest Lord Beards ever, but it's Vlad. So, yeah, but it's uh, Vlad. You know, uh, it just goes on and on because he's Vlad. He can never die. Exactly. Yeah. Every time we try to end the stream, it just comes back on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much for watching. We really appreciate all the support. We hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we will see you guys again soon for something. And uh, take care. <laughs> <Have fun. something. laughs> yeah, we're official here. <laughs> right, bye. See y'all later. Bye bye.